There you go. Okay, so welcome to our fourth uh, International Adaptive Scuba Symposium. My name is Jim Elliott. I'm the president and founder of Dive Heart. And we have some, some great guests, some great programs. We're going to jump right in now to introductions so we know who's in the room. And if I could start right over here with Carol. You want to tell us who you are and, and uh, a little bit about yourself and why you're here? Oh, I'm here to learn more about the Dive Heart organization and how to get involved. Okay, so Mark's wife, Carol. I'm Mark, I'm the guest speaker. Carol's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going, you don't have to go first. Um, uh, there's a, quite a bio on me. You actually spent more time doing this, the presentation. I guarantee you will not be that long. Um, I've been involved with, with working with Jim for almost a little couple years now. Um, I teach occupational therapy at Midwestern University. Um, been a diver with the Divers Force 15 plus years now. Um, and as I'll talk about in a little bit later this afternoon, we're going to start looking and working with Jim and Dive Heart to look at um, a lot of what Jim suspected over the years, which is uh, the possible quality of impact, quality of life impact um, with the Dive Scuba Diamond and how we'll go about doing that. So, yeah. Very cool. It's going to be a great, great presentation. Well, my name is Ruth Brutlug. Uh, used to be Ruth Magnus. For those of you who don't know, I just got married last year. Congratulations. Um, Thanks. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a dive master and also a, a certified scuba buddy with Dive Heart. I've uh, been helping out with Dive Heart for a few years now. And uh, my husband also does. He's a master instructor. So we love to get in the water and teach and help everybody learn how to scuba and enjoy what we enjoy. Yeah, and Ruth has been great. She's with UPS and she's helped us get some grants in the past. And I was just telling uh, Rick earlier that what Ruth is doing is uh, uh, trying to get a grant to help us ship some artificial coral from the Long Beach Aquarium, the Aquarium of the Pacific in, in Long Beach. And um, the coral they don't use, they're going to donate to us. And then we're, with the grant, uh, they're going to ship the coral here. And then what we'll do is store it. And when we build our facility, which we want to build, which we haven't talked about, but it's it's a 100 foot deep facility. It'll be 90 degrees. Um, so people will be able to do research, rehabilitation, education, training, and provide vocational opportunities for people with disabilities. And we'll use the coral to build coral heads that we'll be able to drop in or take out of our, our fishless aquarium uh, at any time we want. So thank you for, for your help with that. So. You're very welcome. Tina? Oh, we're staying on this side. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina. Uh, I volunteer and work for Dive Heart, and I'm a new-ish diver, but, um, and I, I actually learned with the instructors from Dive Heart, and Ruth's husband did my advanced open water last summer, so I'm still very enthusiastic about the experience, and then I became a buddy this past fall, well, late summer, and so I'm working this year on becoming a more experienced buddy. And Tina also is in charge of special projects, so and, you know, a lot of stuff that's going on in the office she's involved with and, um, and some of our new really exciting fundraising stuff that's online where you could actually create a fundraiser for Dive Heart and, uh, and, and it could be a theme thing that you do. It could be around a Super Bowl or it could be around a, an event like um, I leave Sunday for the George Aquarium and, and she helped um, Zach from Atlanta, a young 12-year-old boy who for his Bar Mitzvah project is doing a fundraiser for Dive Heart. And we're leaving uh, Sunday with three uh, divers with disabilities to dive in the Georgia Aquarium. She helped them set up that, that custom page. So thanks for doing that. And thanks for doing this PowerPoint. So <laughs> so if, it, if you don't like it, it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that one was coming. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, I'm Sarah. I was recently certified as a dive master with Ruth's husband. And Ruth, you're the one that got me involved with Dive Heart, so it's not, it's kind of cool. Um, I was in Bonaire, and we met at the airport. Met at the airport, <laughs> helped, you helped me with my mom, and then showed me videos from Dive Heart, and I went that December, and haven't left. So I'm a buddy. <laughs> you and really haven't. No. <laughs> <laughs> been becoming part of me, so yeah. I see there's going to be running a new program with uh, the Center for Independence in the LaGrange, which primarily has uh, patients or clients that have cerebral palsy 
a lot of young people, so that's going to be exciting. Cool. She'll be recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Far. We just moved to Chicago a few months ago from St. Louis. I have a St. Louis buddy here, and uh, just um, was an ex rescue diver at Bon Air in the St. Louis area. And so I wanted to stay with diving and heard about this program. Went online, checked in about it, and there's this orientation meeting that was here in, in the city. And, the end of January, so I attended it and went to two pool sessions, met Sarah, and uh, it's been wonderful. So I'm very pleased to be part of this and want to learn more about it, and become a certified buddy, and do whatever I need. I need to be a dive master, so I'll come back. I give you my husband's Ooh, number. Yeah. <laughs> you know, love diving, love diving, always have. I'm relatively new to diving, though. I've only been diving for about five years. I decided to do something when I turned 50, I was going to do it. You know, my ex-husband had nothing, didn't want water, nothing he could offer, and so decided, I like water, I'm going to do this, and so here I am, 400 dives later. And yeah, Barb's been helping us out a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, she's she's been diving at Bontier. She's been helping us a lot at uh, ICRE, the Illinois Center for Rehabilitation and Education. A rewarding experience. And that's so a trip far. we'll be doing this summer uh, with those kids. Some kids very, very involved, meaning they have a very high dis they're very um, high fun. They're not high functioning. Their disability is uh, pretty lim limits them. But uh, but with the tools like the full face mask and things, we were able to get them in the water. And so thanks for thanks for your help with that. So, Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Zygman. I'm um, a board member with Dive Heart. I've uh, been with them for about nine, ten years. Eight, nine years. I'm sorry. Um, I'm also a PADI instructor, an HSA instructor, and I run three of the programs that we do on a monthly basis. Yeah, it's kind of like what Dave does down in Oak Lawn and, and at Eisenhower with our veterans and also um, Lincoln Tri County. And Tri-County, yeah. Dabble yeah it's kind of like a machine, it really is. I mean, some days they'll run 40 people with disabilities through the pool from 8 a.m. to like 4 p.m. And they'll just do shifts and we have a scout troop that comes in and uh, and helps you know schlep the gear. They got everything marked and they know the sizes and, and get it all squared away. So it's a it's a, in fact they were so impressed uh, when I had Rotarian Rotarians came in from uh, Israel to to see our program. They wanted us to start a program there to help kids with autism. And they came in and saw Dave's program down in Oakland and uh, said, you know what, if if you can do this in Israel, we you know we're, we're on board. So. We went out there for two weeks to Haifa and did a program, and it's because they were so impressed with the, the program that he is going on down there. So thank you for that, Dave. Pete. Hi. <laughs> We're the late one here today. Uh, I'm Pete Murray with Scuba Board. I'm the chairman of the board. Um, I know this guy for so long. And I'm now in the middle of a class with him. I haven't finished it yet, but we're working on it. And I, I live in Key Largo, so I'm going to be the uh, southern point for Dive Heart, as well as helping with anything you guys need with social media. That's my forte. Yeah, and Pete's an instructor trainer, right? With couple I'm an instructor for SDI, TDI, an instructor, trainer, slash evaluator for NASC. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, it was really fun having Pete go through the, the, the last class we have. We haven't quite finished it yet, but um, <laughs> down in, in the Keys. And uh, we'll be down there a lot and get you finished up pretty quick. And he's been a great supporter with Scuba Board and, and taught us a lot about social marketing. If you have an opportunity, Pete does seminars uh, all the time and, and is happy to share his thoughts and strategies and how to really get the most out of um, social media. And, and they do an excellent job at you know, Scuba Board. So. Thank you for that. Um, why don't we jump to the front here and start with Jody? Hi, I'm Jody. Yeah, talk louder, Jody. Okay. Hi, I'm Jody. Is that loud enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've known about Dark Heart for a while now, and uh, the stars are finally aligned where I can jump in and get involved. I'm also a Rotarian, um, so I know jump through that, and um, been diving for quite a while. And I'm a rescue diver. Good thing is. Who was two? 
<laughs> and also Jody is uh, is uh, is Rotarian. <laughs> As a Rotarian, she's helping us with, uh, we, we launched this really kind of cool project in Cozumel recently where we're, the concept is to take individuals with disabilities and create this paradigm shift in their life. Now it's Johnny the scuba diver, not Johnny in a wheelchair. And then what we did is we teamed up with the Marine Park in Cozumel and now um, they are developing a curriculum for these individuals with disabilities who are newly certified and get them in the water and do things like coral reef restoration and stuff like that. And it's a template program that we're hoping we'll, we'll be able to roll out all over the world, wherever there are marine parks. And, uh, and Jody is helping us get an international match, rotary matching grant. And, uh, and we're, we already have clubs in New Jersey and Cozumel and here in the Chicagoland area in our district that have helped out with that. So, Randy? I'm Randy. Uh, we live, uh, Annette and I live south of uh, Indianapolis about an hour. And, uh, got interested in this when Annette found out through someone at the hospital where she works at about uh, Dive Pirates, which is another organization that does uh, adaptive diving. And so we just saw this on the, the uh, schedule here and we wanted to come in and, and see what it was all about. And we're, we're pretty recent divers. I've since 2007 I believe we dive in Cozumel a lot though we've been there five times I think love it I've only been doing about five years so you have a couple more years on me but yeah I'm a critical care nurse so in the hospitals in Indianapolis and I had a patient who had a heart attack and she passed out and her daughter did CPR and if her daughter was trained um, in order to be part of dive pirates I guess so she was the one that opened my eyes to the adaptive diving and I went home and told him about it he's like well, that's so cool so that's why we're here today beautiful thank you for being here I'm Susan from St. Louis <laughs> and I just came to the, the show here and I wanted to see how this organization worked because I love diving and I have a rescue diver and I just wanted to see how I could use diving to help other people because it's a passion so I'm here just to learn Excellent. Thank you for being here. Julio, uh, I came to Dive Park about three and a half years ago as a caddy instructor and then got certified with Jim as a Handicap School Association instructor in Maryville, Indiana. Oh. So, um, I've just been hooked, that's all I can say. After the first, first symposium was an autistic symposium and I've been hooked ever since. I love working with the kids, children, disabled, adults, and the vets also. That's what I like to do. Yeah, and, and Julio is uh, spearheading a program down at Chicago State University where we work uh, a lot with vets, but it's, uh, it's an incredible complex that's really underused. They have a four to six foot pool, uh, swimming pool, and then they have an eight foot swimming pool, and then they have a 13 foot deep well all on this campus and uh, it's in a it's it's in the south side of the city um, and it just is, is underutilized but they're they've opened their arms to us and we're just going to be running that program so thank you for that so. uh, my name is rick stratton i'm uh, uh, with uh, the dive news network and i'm supportive of dive i'm supportive of dive heart and uh, it's its mission and uh dis disabled scuba in general so part of my job is to promote the sport from a variety of angles and to cover the cover the sport of diving. So I'm here both as a journalist but also a sponsor. Yeah, and, and Midwest Dive News, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, it's great. Rick is, uh, has always been a big supporter and, and part of this symposium since day one. So thank you so much for that. So, sir? Um, my name is John Bernagy. I've been a diver for 30 years and I've worked with paralyzed veterans. No, we're we're about we're we're about to work with. For, oh, so in the Chicagoland area, what kind of things do you do with paralyzed veterans? I'm the caregiver. Gotcha. I wanted to see what this is about. Gotcha, gotcha. Beautiful. Well, thank you all uh, for for uh, now we all know a little bit more about each other. Please feel free at any point to to jump in and and add. I mean, there's a lot of experience in the room here in a lot of different areas. So, I definitely want to um, you know tap into that, and I think we'll all get a lot more out of it. So, the first thing I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the um, kind of the state of the state where we are in adaptive diving. Um, when I started doing this, I, I, I 
for those of you that don't know, my uh, my daughter is blind from birth, and uh, when she got to be nine, they mainstreamed her with sighted children. The, the sighted kids teased her on the playground because her her eyes kind of darted back and forth, and she said, you know, and they teased her, and she said, Dad, you know, I can read, and she could, she could read a two-inch letter about a half an inch from her face, so she said, I'm not blind, and she threw down her cane and refused to learn Braille. Um, so I'm like, what am I going to do with this kid? You know, she doesn't want to be blind, and so I was at WGN Radio at the time, and um, one of the announcers there got me involved with the downhill ski program for people with disabilities uh, and, and blind specifically. And I got her up on the hill, and in a couple of weeks she would go to school, and, and, and they said, well, what would you do this weekend, Aaron? And she'd say, well, I'll, I was I was skiing. And they're like, yeah, sure, you're skiing, you're blind. How do you ski? And she'd say, no, here's the pictures. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, I'm blind and I can ski. How do how, you know? That, that was amazing, and uh, it, it, it was created a paradigm shift. Now it wasn't Aaron the blind kid anymore, it was Aaron the skier, and that helped build confidence, independence, and self-esteem. And what happened was then she excelled in grade school, middle school, high school, she won awards, and, and I blame it on the skiing. So I thought, well, you know, if skiing can work, I know diving can work, because I'd been diving since 76, and I thought, I was a journalism major, and I thought if I ever have an opportunity to dive with someone like Jacques Cousteau, you know, I, I better know how to scuba dive. Now, how many people know who Jacques Cousteau is? <laughs> Everybody in the room, right? Usually when I present to groups under 40, it's like, people are like, really, who's Jacques Cousteau? And I, I start feeling old at that point. I'm like, really, you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is? Right, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So. Um, so I knew. What's that? Dan Waterman. Dan Waterman. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, I, I knew. So I primarily I thought if we could take individuals with disabilities, physical disabilities, and get them out of their wheelchairs and get them in the water, it could change their lives and maybe have the same <coughs> confidence-building effects that um, that skiing did for my daughter. So uh, so that that kind of was the concept, and it's really really exciting what's happened since 97 when we started doing this because what we've seen is not only does this build confidence independence and self-esteem but it's actually become a therapy and uh, that's i know what has excited uh mark at midwestern and also um, you know the folks over at Duke and uh, Chicago School of Psychology has has also done some projects for us as well and and we're kind of capturing the imagination of the industry and recently um, we've been able we've been presenting the hyperbaric conferences uh, in, in the Northeast um, this uh, uh, April May and or uh, March April and May we'll be presenting to um, to some medical conferences in Boston where nurse groups are working with uh, individuals with different forms of disabilities. And the concept there is um, to get the nurses to really, and I know you said you're a nurse, right? To get them to think about their patients, not, not their disability, yeah, making them focus on the abilities and have them think outside the box a little bit and be creative and um, use their imagination, help, help the individual with the disability imagine the possibilities in their life. So we kind of captured their imagination. We'll be presenting to thousands of nurses uh, in the Boston that come in for this conference in the Boston area. That? That's going to be, uh, I'll give you the dates, March, April, and May. We have three dates. They're on, our, they're on our calendar, right? So if you go to the calendar. Yeah, there's a concept, there's a, there is a uh, convention in May. That I was thinking about going to in Boston. That's oh, very good. Well, maybe maybe it's the same one. Yeah. Maybe it's the same one. It'd be great to have you. Yeah, it's um, so so. It's exciting because the growth. In, in this area is not necessarily in the diving community, it's in the medical community. And this isn't even about, about scuba diving for me, this is about helping people with disabilities imagine the possibilities in their life. So, so as we move forward now with individuals like Mark doing, doing research, um, you know, as he does research and, and starts finding things that they can measure, then they'll start publishing things. And once they start publishing things, then they'll be able to reach out for grants. And once they are able to get some grants, they'll be able to do more, more research. And, uh, and I, I see this eventually someday being something that we'll be able to go to insurance companies. And not us necessarily, but researchers and therapists will be able to go to insurance companies and bill insurance companies. And, and what we've seen um, with spinal cord injuries, for example, it's a great, uh, a great category because almost to a person, if we can get individuals with spinal cord injuries down to three atmospheres, 60 feet, 
almost to a person they come up with some type of, of pain relief and a lot of times they're pain free if you have a chance to go on the dive heart website and watch um, you know if you or, or you go to YouTube and you, you search for dive heart and then you um, go to Ian Brown Ian Brown is, uh, is an Air Force pilot who had a spinal cord injury uh, was hit by a vehicle and he's a medical student now so he really articulates what he feels has, has been the cause of his, uh, his, you know, uh, you know, his relief of pain when he's diving. But, um, but he talks, he's in Cozumel and he talks for probably about 10 minutes or 15 minutes in this video about how it was the first time in 11 years he was pain free when he was with us in Cozumel. And, and you say, well, why does that happen? And a team we trained in New Mexico took some doctors from um, John Hopkins down to uh, came in a couple years ago, I think it was a year ago, uh, two years ago, July, and they found that there's an extra output of serotonin in a pilot study in veterans with spinal cord injuries. Well, and serotonin helps helps with pain management, right, anxiety, so uh, PTSD and, and traumatic brain injuries, and these individuals primarily had spinal cord injuries, they, um, they saw some benefit right away, and there's, um, there's stuff up on, on the website, I'm sure, that talks a little bit about, about that, but they're excited, you know, and, and it's a very exciting time in the industry. When we also started, none of the major training agencies had adaptive programs. And after talking for Drew, to Drew Richardson at Patty for about two hours a year ago, March, they finally launched, they were the last of the Mohicans, they launched a, uh, a, an adaptive scuba program called Depth Therapy. So each agency is, is um, SDI, SSI, and we're an SDI facility. They have a program called Scubility. Uh, SSI is a program, Doug McNeese is, was a keynote uh, speaker here in the past. Um, we also had IAHD, the International Association of Handicapped Divers, as keynote speakers. Uh, we're in a, we're, I'm an instructor trainer for the Handicapped Scuba Association, and they kind of were the pioneers in formalizing and standardizing adaptive scuba training uh, back in the early 80s. So it's, um, it's been around a while, and really uh, adaptive scuba, I think, started really with the first instructor who somebody came up to, and one of his buddies came up to him and said, hey, look at it, you know, I, I really like what you do. I have no legs, can you help me out? And I, though that's really where adaptive scuba started. And for you instructors in the audience, you know that, that basically what we do every time we put somebody in the water is we adapt, right? And uh, I've had to adapt more with able-bodied students than I have with students with disabilities, to be honest with you. I mean, somebody with a disability who wants to do this has really made the commitment, I think, mentally a lot of times. And, and they've got, they go, I'm going to do this. I'm going to really really give it my all where you know sometimes as instructors we know when you get drug into a class you know by your buddy your friend or your spouse it's kind of like you know really do I need to be here kind of thing so it's uh, it's very exciting and it's a tool um, if you go up on the website and you, you listen to Sarah Kloss from who is the head of care coordination at Shriners Children's Hospital some from symposiums in the past she'll talk about how at Shriners they use scuba diving as a tool to help them um, move Johnny from a newly a new spinal cord injury to independence and for example if Johnny can't catheterize on his own or he can't be independent in his bowel program well then Johnny can't go on the dive heart trip and Johnny's seen the visit video so he's going man I want to go on that trip that looks pretty cool so so they use it as a tool to help people in their rehabilitation so it's, it's very exciting what's going on with that as well so is, is there any questions at all any comments no? Okay, great. Well, I'd like to then move into the next phase, and what we'll do is, um, don't turn the lights down yet, Rick, but in a second when I get this started, there's, there's two real, the heavy lifting that we do is in swimming pools. So there's kind of two components to our training. Once we've got somebody squared away and identified and they've got all their paperwork that they're going to do a pool program with us, a, a, we call it a dive heart scuba experience program. We, uh, we, we do the pool training, and, and this first video is, is about that, and it shows you the types of people we can get in the water and the types of disabilities we can serve, and basically, pretty much anybody with a disability can dive unless they have open wounds, okay, or if they have pressure-related illnesses, they can't go deep. Otherwise, we've taken some people, you know, Matt Johnson, who some of you know, Matt Johnson is, uh, is, has muscular dystrophy, he can only move his thumbs, and he can't breathe on his own, he needs a ventilator to breathe, and he's a diver. Now he can only go down as far as his, his, uh, his vent will take him, but DUI made a custom dry suit where a port comes in here and goes up to his trach. So, um, 
you know, he goes down with a full face mask and a dry suit so, it, you know, he doesn't have any water come in and, and uh, interrupt his breathing. But it, it's amazing. And, and we went to Northwestern University engineering students to do projects for us. And, and they said, what can we help you with, Jim? And I said, well, I want you to take Matt Johnson. I showed him pictures of Matt Johnson underwater uh, with his dry suit and his, his vent all hooked up and his uh, ventilator up on the surface. I said, I want you to make it so he can go deeper than 15 feet. So they, they basically did. They went to Walmart and they got a big plastic box and I gave them a whole bunch of scuba gear that they cut up into a million pieces and they had everything squared away. They went out and bought a ventilator and they put it in the box and, and they made it work. They made it so that they could, we could use scuba and use the respirator, the technology that's out there, put it in a closed container, which I liken to an underwater camera, right, camera housing. And of course, we want redundancy because I don't know about you, Pete, but every time I've been on a dive with with Matt, his ventilators failed, right? <laughs> and they're pulling him out of the water pretty quick, you know. I'm putting him either on an Ambu bag or getting that other ventilator hooked up, and and that's really high speed and adaptive diving. That makes diving with a quadriplegic look like a walk in the park, really, when you when you dive with Matt Johnston. So. Um, so anyway, that, so the pool is where the heavy lifting is done, and I think what we're going to do is start with that. And uh, this is a piece that was recently done here in Chicago. Is that the wrong one? Next page. Next page. Arrow down. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm technically impaired. These young people are not only learning how to swim and dive, they're finding miracles in the water. The full story next in our home in Chicago. When his daughter was born blind, this father used his organizational skills to start a program for blind skiers. <laughs> then he had another idea. Jim Elliott started a scuba diving program for disabled children, and he's had amazing results. His story is tonight's Art Norman in Chicago. Here. Thank you, Robin Nelson. Elliott is the winner of a prestigious National Volunteer of the Year Award. His foundation is called Dive Heart. <laughs> These are disabled kids discovering their new ability to move, walk, and experience an angry environment underwater at the Illinois Rehabilitation Facility in Chicago, and they can't stop smiling. The program is called Dive Heart. His founder is Jim Elliott, a former television executive who left his job to do this. You use the latest full-face scuba technology to change lives. Natalie and Connor, they never would be able to hold a regulator in their mouth. That allows so many people who would never have a chance to scuba dive and get, get out of their wheelchairs and do this. Jim and his team of volunteers specialize in building confidence, self-esteem, and independence without fees. You have a disability, you have weakness in your limbs, underwater, the playing field is level for everybody. Elliot says this facility on the West Loop is just the beginning. Plans are underway to build a brand new dedicated facility elsewhere in Chicago. We have an opportunity to really change the world, and I mean that sincerely. We could revolutionize rehabilitation for people with disabilities. Not only is diving therapeutic for the kids, it brings them joy. It's really fun. I get to move around and, and diving is a lot of fun. What do you think about the volunteers who are we're helping you swim in the water. Dave, well done. What's it like in the water out there with Jim Elliott in the game? I can only describe it as freedom. What group of kids? Next week, Jim will be taking a different group of kids on an unbelievable scuba diving adventure in Casamel, Mexico, absolutely positively free. He wants them to see the colorful wonders of the ocean in a near zero gravity environment. For more information, go to our website. We are www.nbcchicago.com and search using the keyword dive hard. Dive hard, one word. That's right. beautiful. Wow. It's such freedom and, and all these other benefits to it too. It's a, it's a real plus. He's a, he's a great guy. Thanks <laughs> for bringing us the story. All right, Thomas, I appreciate it. Hey, lights up. Lights up. Everybody saw. Everybody saw Sarah in there. She was a star. Um, you know what I love? I love the the way that guy goes dive hard. You know, don't you? It's like God. I love that guy. I love that guy. Art Norman's great. He really is. One word. Dive hard. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna get him, man, to do some voiceover stuff for us. Make a note. Somebody, make a note. Um, 
that's where the heavy lifting is done, right? I mean, you guys that, are, that have done this before, um, you saw Natalie, who, who was very, very spastic in the water. I mean, almost to where you couldn't control her, and you know, you're trying to put the full face mask on her, and it's like a moving target, right? I mean, Sarah, you just worked with her. Yeah, and um, we had her in the Keys, and Mike Kaufman, who Pete, you know, um, one of our instructors down there and board members, he actually, after the second day, he said, Jim, her, her spasms have really quieted down, if not gone away completely. And it was true. It was amazing. She just, she just got, and we didn't go deep. We didn't go deep. We probably were no deeper than 30 feet. So that was an incredible, um, an incredible, you know, sign that we saw. The other, the other uh, kid that was on the trip who's going to be diving with us again, uh, Connor, is, um, is, has, a, has really a barrel chest, big barrel chest, and his legs are very atrophied from birth, his cerebral palsy. And inaudible, very hard to understand, couldn't hold a regulator in his mouth to save his life, but with the full face mask, we're able to get him down. And actually, once we, once we get him down and, and adjust his buoyancy and teach him how to use his breathing, he's able to, to really be, use what abilities he does have to, to be completely independent. And a lot of times, this is the first time in their life that they've been free from gravity and in, you know, out of their wheelchairs and stuff. And, and that does incredible things for them. The, uh, the, the thing that we like to do is, uh, we like to take a lot of photos and a lot of video because with social media nowadays, thank you very much, Pete and, and uh, Rick, we uh, were able to, to give them tools that they can go out and share their stories with, right? It's like you now they go to, to events and you know family functions and somebody says, well, would you do this weekend? Well, I was diving. And it's like, yeah, right, you have a traumatic brain injury, you know, you have no legs and you're, you know, you're blind. And, and, and they go, yeah, check out my Facebook page. You know, so now they have bragging rights. And if nothing else, you know, they have that. I'll never forget when my, my daughter took snowboarding you know, so here's a blind snowboarder, right? And she, uh, and, and she only did it once. She fell on her butt so many times. She said, ah, I don't think I'm going to do this. I'm going to stick with skiing. But she had bragging rights. You know, she could do it. And that's part of it. And uh, so we can take video and photos, and they can put it up on, on their website. And then we can share it with the world as well. And, and I would encourage you, if you know people with disabilities or, or individuals that might want to get involved in doing this, go to our website and like I said on YouTube they have a lot of great videos just dive hard and you can go to NBC and get this story or you could go to CNN who spent a week with us down in the Florida Keys um, and it was really interesting the third day down in the Keys the producer from CNN came up to me and said oh he goes I get it he goes scuba divers he goes you guys are the poor man's astronaut and I go dude I'm totally using that line you know and, and it's true uh, on that trip we had gold star families families who lost loved ones in Iraq and Afghanistan and we had veterans with disabilities and we the concept was they each have new normals you know the the gold star families have lost loved ones in Iraq and Afghanistan and the, and the vets with disabilities have lost something they're no longer the person that they were when when they were uh, went into the service so I thought you know we put these two groups together and they face challenges together and they you know it's kind of exciting it's kind of scary and then what they do is they, they heal together and, and ultimately that was the goal and and it turned out to be incredible uh, when I saw the CNN video video uh, journalist who'd been to Afghanistan and Iraq in Colombia and just filmed horrific things around the world um, come around a pole after he had filmed one night when we were doing a debriefing he's filming a set of gold star families and, and what they were their experience was and tears are running down his eyes I knew that we had really you know scored on, on that one it was it was incredible so with that, what we, what we do is we try to get folks squared away in the pool, and, and, and that's, again, where we do the heavy lifting. But then what we try to do is we try to set a goal as a, for a trip. Now, maybe the trip is six months or a year down the road. Um, but it, what it does is it gives people a reason to get up in the morning. Okay? especially for a lot of vets coming back, right? Vets with, uh, who, who have new ability. Motivation's everything, isn't it? I mean, we've had guys that, that we, they know they're going to go on a trip in six months, so you know, they get up in the morning. It gives you a reason to get up in the morning, first of all, right? And then they go, you know, I better go to the gym and work on these guns, you know? I'm going to be, I'm going to be on a dive trip, you know, and, and, uh, in the Caribbean, you know, in six months. And so I think that's important. It's important to have hope and a reason to get up 
And uh, as you may or may not know, more veterans with disabilities, or more veterans, period, who are returning, have committed suicide than have died in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And that was true in Vietnam as well, where over 50,000 died in combat, and over 60,000 came back and committed suicide. Um, I just presented to an organization on the northwest side, a veterans organization, and um, a, a woman came up to me from the organization and said, God, I really wish that I had met you six months ago. She said, because my husband, who's a Vietnam vet, huge diver, had some disabilities, and, and I don't remember if it, it, what exactly it was that happened, but when, he was so depressed you know, that he, you know, he was a Vietnam vet, and, and he f committed suicide just, I mean, just recently. You know, over all that, all that time, he had survived. And, and um, so I think this is a tool, and, and, you know, it's not the only tool out there, but, boy, if we can do something, whether it's just a pool program or whether it's a, a life-changing scuba adventure trip, if we can do something to stem the tide of suicide just a little bit, in veterans with disabilities, and I think we're doing something. And we've had people go from just one pool experience, one pool experience, and it's changed their life. It's amazing. It's a, it's really amazing. It's we had somebody I'll never forget Kim, who had cerebral palsy so severe she was inaudible. She had she was able to use a power chair with the joystick, but there was no way we were going to get a regulator in her mouth. And she was very sedentary. Somebody talked her into coming to this program. And after one pool session, she came out of it and goes, wow, I'm a scuba diver. Now imagine, you know, her body is ravaged with cerebral palsy, but cognitively, she's 100%. She's just like you or I, or, or at least like you guys. That was a joke. You could laugh. It's okay. um, but then she went on and took on other challenges. She came to us through a special rec association, and all of a sudden she's out there doing things that she never ever thought she would be doing and everybody's coming to us going oh my god Kim is like a rock star now man she's doing this and this and this and that's one pool session Pete yeah I think it's really important for us to use that uh, you, you said it, it gives them a reason to wake up in the morning we need to actually encourage them to start talking about that I know for Matt Johnson he was on scoop board every other day talking about how he was going to go diving you know i have a dream and uh you know diving the dream was his thing and it made such an impact not only on matt but on people who read about matt all the people on scoop were like wow what do i have to I, you know look at my life i have nothing to complain about compared to matt but i, I think as a marketing tool getting these people talking about what they do because even if they're disabled they have ways of communicating they have ways speech recognition programs they have all sorts of ways of getting on the internet and telling their story because we can talk about it all the time but till they tell their story it's not going to really be heard that's really really important what, what pete said about sharing the story you know i, I know as, as a young instructor i learned that stories stick and facts fade so we could talk all day about statistics but boy when i told you a story about kim you're going to go back and you're going to you're going to maybe share that with somebody a family you know who has a child with cerebral palsy or uh, or or a veteran with a disability or somebody with a spinal cord injury going dude you should check out diving you know people with that you know dive harder seeing guys come up pain free right with spinal cord injury so yeah sharing this story pete is, is really important thank you for for bringing that point up um so so one you know we, we get them ready in the pool and then the goal again is to do the trip and and this next segment was on nbc nightly news and talk about sharing the story this story went kind of kind of viral for us uh, being on broadcast and, and especially the nightly news on nbc was was great my sister actually called me from new york and she was in a cab and she'd been out to dinner so she had a couple glasses of wine and she's like jim elliott jim elliott she goes oh my god your story's in in the cab on nbc and then another buddy somebody maybe even in this room saw it in, in a united flight somebody was flying on, on uh, united and saw it so so there's a lot of venues out there scuba board obviously being a huge one in the dive industry but but it's amazing when, once they have a, a story like this it can be shown again and again and again and I know what we'll do is we'll reintroduce stories like Tammy Duckworth who was uh, she, we met her through the Department of Veterans Affairs where she was a director and then she became the assistant secretary of the VA and now she just won a seat in Congress I think one of two people in Congress that have disabilities and you know 
she got involved with us and, and when Turning Point came and did a piece that ran on PBS all over the country last year, a documentary, she came down um, in the middle of her congressional run and, and took, a, took some time and did an interview and it was about a 20 minute interview that she did and it was incredible. She didn't talk about politics at all. Tammy talked about being, uh, first of all, serving her country. And, and her story was she was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot and an RPG landed in her lap. And she, she lost her right leg at the hip, left leg at the knee, and about 50% use of her right arm. If it hadn't been for her crew pulling her out, she would have, of course, perished on sight. And so she lives every day honoring those, uh, those soldiers that pulled her out and, and saved her life. She also talked about what it was like to, to deal with her new normal and her disabilities and, and cope and go on and move forward. And then she talked about the, the problems that we just mentioned about veterans and returning vets with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries and some of the things that are going on in, in that, uh, that area. And then she talked about, she was a diver in Hawaii before her injury. So she talked about diving before her injury and after her injury. And we got her in the water first time after she was shot down in Iraq. And she talked about therapy, it being a therapy, and, and physically and psychologically for the individual, but also talked about what we see all the time when we go to other countries where we're helping individuals with disabilities on the beach, and here's a business person who walks over and says, oh my God, thank God for what you're doing, because these children or these adults in, in our country would never have a chance to experience something like this. When I went to China in 07 to help start up a program there, I didn't see any people with disabilities, none. I mean, you know, you wouldn't think there was anybody with disabilities in China. Well, they're there. They're just, they're in, the, they're in this room, and, you know, and that's where they kind of exist. Um, so, well, you know, thank God we live in this country, in America, and we have that opportunity to, uh, and, and God knows, the Paralympics, I don't know how many of you saw the Paralympics, but I really enjoyed the way they marketed that, because now, you, this is not a just adaptive sports, these people are not special, these people are superhuman. And that's the way they marketed it. And I thought it was fabulous marketing. And that's the story. I mean, they are. I mean, we get up in the morning. Somebody says, what's a good day for you, Jim? I go, when I get up and I go to the washroom without a catheter, that's a good day. You know what I mean? Because people we work with are doing bowel programs and catheters. And you know, a you know, young person that wants to go on the boat with us, if we're on an 8 o'clock boat ride, they're up at probably 5 o'clock in the morning doing a bowel program. Because if they don't, they're going to have a problem on the boat, right? And, uh, and, and when you go through the course, you learn about things like autonomic dysreflexia, which is a rise in your blood pressure when there's a noxious stimulus. And it could be maybe your buddy's accidentally bent your toe back in a boot, but 90% of the time it's just having to go to the bathroom, you know. So uh, those are things we take for granted, you know, in our, in our normal. Um, let's move on and show you what uh, the trip was like. Did they do it? Got it? Okay, great. And then... Um, and this was down in Key Largo, and we had a bunch of kids from the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, and, um, and, and I'll let you listen to their story. Did I do that right? There we go. That's pretty fall down. Oh, did I? There we go. So I told you, I told you. It's he trouble. Is it loud enough? Water. Yeah. Nightly news begins now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, helping those who can often have trouble navigating the everyday world. Well, of all things, scuba diving may not seem like the easiest thing for those with uh, disabilities to master, but it turns out to be a rather perfect fit with the help of one man who is dedicated to making a difference in this way. Good story from NBC's Gary Sanders. They got seven miles off the Florida Keys. Five Chicago area kids told for so long what they could not do. I'm not scared, no. Are about to prove everyone wrong. 14 year old Evelyn Felipe is partially paralyzed, born with spina bifida. 12 year old Sam Daly has cerebral palsy and Asperger's. Alex Ding, his left leg eight inches shorter than his right. 17-year-old Elise Oak and 12-year-old Zan Bondo, 
both born with cerebral palsy. A most unlikely group of divers because scuba can be so scary for first timers. Team three is. But Jim Elliott, the father of a blind daughter, knew that was no excuse. The lasting impact is self-esteem, confidence, going forward instead of going backwards. Having people, having people look at you differently is important. For more than a decade, Jim and his group Dive Heart have made the impossible routine. Volunteer Stephanie Dominici remembers her initial plunge seven years ago. As an infant, she contracted polio from a bad vaccine. That dive was the first pain-free day of her life. I had pain in my foot every single day. And, you know, those 20, 25 minutes that I do get to go down, or even the hour that I get to go down, my mind is free. Don't feel it. Don't feel a thing. Beyond therapeutic, the gravity-free world down here can be magical. Among the fishing corals with the wheelchairs left behind, paralysis is not limiting. Physical disabilities no longer a challenge. It felt great. It was awesome. What about the sharks? Do you see any? No. Yeah. I'm kind of glad about that. <laughs> I never felt free in my life until I was going to die. Just like free to do anything. Free now to do anything. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, off the Florida Keys. And that is our broadcast on a Tuesday night. Thank you for being here with us. I'm Brian Williams, and of course, we hope to see you right back here tomorrow evening. Good night. That's the goal, right, is to, is to get him on that trip. Little Evelyn, who we just saw, is actually leaving with us Sunday to go down to the Georgia Aquarium, where we're going to be diving with whale sharks and hammerheads. And it's the largest aquarium in the world. If, if you haven't been there, you should go there and check it out. She's going to see sharks this time. Yeah. She'll see, yeah, see a lot of sharks. The coolest thing is she's going down as an expert, right? Because she's going to be the entertainment for she, the party, She is, right? yeah. Yeah, she's... Uh, Evelyn and Greg Rodriguez, who some of you know is a Marine with a traumatic brain injury, and then um, Kyle Brown, who is a young man who wanted to be a firefighter and was uh, in a vehicle accident, and now he has a traumatic brain injury also. His mother, uh, uh, Denise, helps us out in the office. They were sponsored by actually a 12-year-old boy out of Atlanta. His name is Zach Bernstein, and Zach's vision was to, to help dive hard do what we do, helping children, adults, and veterans with disabilities. And so his, his parents, they got on the phone with me and they said, Jim, we want to help you out and do a fundraiser. And, and so I said, that's great. I thought, you know, we'll raise a few hundred dollars for Dive Heart. And uh, then his mother says, well, you know, his sister, his twin sister, did a fundraiser for us last year. And uh, she raised $20,000 for a charity. And I said, really? I said, when do you want to see me in Atlanta? And I went down to Atlanta in August. and. We were left with fifteen thousand dollars with the checks, so it was it was amazing, and that was we did a pool experience program, kind of like you saw. And what happened was really almost the exact same thing you saw with Art Norman's piece. Um, actually, this was kind of again leveraging working with guys like Rick and and, and uh, Pete and leveraging opportunities and being able to identify opportunities. We uh, the producer from the nightly news piece lived in Atlanta, and, and, and when I found out he lived in Atlanta, then I, I said, boy, we're going to Atlanta. And this kid, this 12-year-old kid, has got this, this vision to help dive hard. I said, that, I said, now, I mean, you know, service above self is, is the rotary motto. And I said, this is what this kid's doing. And uh, it was amazing. They, uh, they got the local affiliate on board, and um, they did, did a story, and it was, it was off the charts. So it was wonderful. So we're going to be going. Evelyn's going to be going. Uh, she has spina bifida, and she's with Rehab Institute of Chicago. And, and then uh, these two young men with traumatic brain injuries, and we'll be diving in the aquarium. And um, I think they rented out the entire ballroom. So we'll have, I don't know how many people we'll have in this ballroom with looking through the glass. And, and you're right, Evelyn will be part of the show. So that'll be pretty cool. We're doing that Monday. So. The, um, any comments, guys, who've been on trips? Do you have any, any, anything you want to add, Dave? Or, you know, I'll never forget one of Dave's first trips with, uh, what was the young lady from? Uh, Mallory. Mallory, right, yeah. Mallory was a special case. I remember, I think what really locked me in was, <clears throat> we were down, we were in a pool and couldn't get her to the bottom of the pool. But nothing. And I asked Jim to come over and help and we went through a couple of things and 
Uh, finally got her to bottom of the pool. We come back up. We got her gear off. I turn around, got my gear off. I turn around, and she just gave me this big hug. At that point, she just melt. It's, you know, it's, you can say paid in full, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> That's what we do it for, the, the, the happiness you get out, the kids get out of it and stuff like that. And she's been on a number of trips, and, you know, we've developed different things along the way. You know, she wants to do things herself. But not always, she can't always do them herself. So, you know, we made up signals. When she got tired, she'd look at me and she'd go like this. <laughs> and I'd grab her tank and we'd move That's along. Good. And when she got ready to go, she just started moving her arms because she wanted to do as much as she could on herself. And, you know, she pushed to get it and she worked very hard. And most of the kids do work very hard to get there. They, um, parents give up a lot, you know, they come and they, I mean, I've seen kids take 10, 15 sessions just to clear their mask. I've seen a kid take his mask off with no hands and put it back on because he wanted to. He took his power inflator hose off and put it back on with no hands underwater. That's amazing. That, it, he wanted to do it. He wanted to say, I can do that skill. And he did. So, you know, people do, and I, and I have people in the water say, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on, I got a video to show you because <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work for me anymore. <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they do some amazing things. And, and a lot of times, I think, and you know, a lot of people here are volunteers, I think the volunteers get more out of it sometimes than the participants do. Because I think that's what keeps us coming back. Absolutely, yeah. Really, really great input. Can I check yeah. someone up? Yeah. Hopefully, they don't break down. <laughs> Who's <laughs> 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 crying? Who's our crier? I'm gonna cry. I was gonna bring up uh, Daryl Young, Vietnam yeah. vet, yeah. spinal cord injury, right? Yes. And I've seen him doing flips underwater. You know, and uh, Greg, right. traumatic brain injury. You know, from when I first uh, came into dive heart, you guys, you told me he he was in a coma after his car uh, accident. Then he went to a wheelchair, and he went to uh, the, the, the Walker. walkers with the arm crutches here, to a cane, and now he's working out for a, a marathon, you know, wow. and, um, oh, I was going to bring up one other one, I can't remember. I mean, I just see, like you're saying, changes in their, their, their psyche and, and, and uh, emotionally and spiritually and physically and everything. Well, and beyond the, the the participants, the parents too, how much they get out of it. How about Sarah? That this summer we were at Four Lakes, and this just speak louder. Comes, yeah. He comes with his son, and um, he, you know, he he's like, well, his friend, his, the parents told us to bring him, and the friend couldn't come that day, so they were kind of on their own, and they really didn't know what to expect. And we get his son Justin. His name was. You remember this? And um, we get him down into the water and. He didn't come up for like 25 minutes, you know. So he's down and they're doing laps and they're, you know, working with him. Cherry Ann was working with him. And uh, I'm a, I come up and the dad just, he looks at me he's like, you have <coughs> exceeded all expectations, you know. I can't believe he's been down there. We've had parents comment, I can't believe that they've paid enough attention to you because you have kids who have autism or something where they're, it's hard to keep their attention and, and, their parents are like when we come here when he they do a session they're all about paying attention to you and focusing and you know, because that's what they want to do they want to get down under the water I, I love talking to the parents because the parents I, it, to me that touches me so much because as a parent I understand how much you want your children to enjoy life and to get good experiences and when you see the look on their faces as they're looking at their kids having this experience it's priceless to me okay Jim, I got a reverse experience. Yeah, just yeah. speak up a little bit, Ken. Sure. I have a fellow that used to come down um, for a few experiences that we had in, in Michigan. We work with the Brain Injury Association of Michigan, with Miami, and they put out the word to the vets. And we had a TBI individual come down from Traverse City, which is all the way downstate, back to us, down near Ann Arbor, north of, north of Ann Arbor. And he came down with his kids. And he did the experience in front of his kids. Well, I mean, it's something that he could never do without our help for him. But he's done something that made his kids say, wow, Dad. So how do you think he felt? You know, it, it really added to him. He's been down for two or three different 
he always makes a way down there. He, he had an unusual circumstance. We had a band. We, we do our stuff at the local high school. A band up there rehearsing, and his trigger was noise. And mm. of course, this rock and roll band is up there making an awful lot of noise. And Dan says, I can feel my trigger. Okay, he lay back in the water, the noise disappeared, he was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it worked secondhand for, for him in, in that fashion, too. But uh, to see his, uh, actually the kids were twins, a boy and a girl, look at him, I could, I could see there was a little different look in there. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Ken's with our team that we trained up in Michigan and Brighton, kind of just outside of Detroit. And, um, you know, we've done programs in, in over 100 cities in, in the U.S. and uh, China, Australia, Israel. We just started a chapter in the U.K. We're moving towards doing more and more chapters. Uh, we have a Northeast chapter based in New Jersey, and uh, we'll be starting probably later this year, if not this year, next year, a Southeast chapter where we have a, a strong following. And one of our goals is uh, in the U.S., really, well, North America pretty much, the only place to really go diving in open water outside of the few weeks we have during the summer, right, here in, here in locally in Chicago or around the country where you have lakes and quarries, is South Florida. You know, so the Keys and, you know, along that eastern coast where you got some current, it's really, really a great tool to use when you're working with people with disabilities. Once you get them buoyant and, and teach them how to control their breath, and we're going to see a video in a, in a few minutes of a, of a guy that uh, swam the length of three football fields underwater just using his breath. And uh, again, the pool, the pool, we can turn them around in a pool fast. So it's amazing. And, and you get those experiences that Dave was talking about and, and Julio was talking about and, and Ken now. Um, the one thing we've seen too is, is you know, people who are born with disabilities, if they have a great support system, it's wonderful. I mean, you've seen kids with disabilities. Evelyn's a great example who will take on anything, you know, and run through walls. And then you, but you have the vast majority are told they can't do things. You know, you can't play basketball because you're blind. You know, you, you really can't do that because you, you know, you're in a wheelchair. So um, they grow up believing they can't do things. And when, when I identify with somebody with a disability, I, I don't see their disability, I, I just see their abilities. And that's what we work with. We work with, if, if this is all you got, range of motion wise, then guess what? That's what we're gonna work with. And we try to adapt and we make that work for the individual. And, and uh, I'll never forget, I had a lady with no arms and no legs. Um, she, had, she had arms, like a stub, very wow. small stubs. And one, yeah, Anna, yeah, and one, one leg, or stump was a little bit wider than the other one. It almost was looked like a fin that she would actually sit on in her wheelchair, kind of folded up under her. And she made me a little bit crazy because I would get her in the pool when I first got her in the pool. Now I hold on to her tank valve and I, and I communicate and say, are you okay? And I'm bringing her through the water and then she thinks she's helping me by swimming. So she's got this fin, you know, that she's, just, she's doing, and, and she's like, I'm going like this. And, and how many times does that happen, right? Greg used to do that too, right? Greg and, and Octavia, we've had, we've had individuals who do have movement. And what, so what I tell them is, you know, we were gonna do one of two things. Either I'm gonna hold on to you and you're gonna get quiet, or I'm gonna make you independent and we're gonna teach you how to use what abilities you do have. And, and that's what we wanna do. That's the ultimate goal. Although sometimes if you don't communicate that effectively, <laughs> you're underwater and, and you kind of got a Bronco thing going on. So, um, but, but from birth, a lot of people are told what they can't do. And, um, and that, that this, is, this is new for them. I mean, we've been doing this now. I've been doing this full time since 97. You know, seven days a week is as much as I can. And um, it's, it, there's so many people that still don't know what we're doing. Uh, it's not on the radar for people with disabilities. You know, traumatic injuries is, is another category. You come back, you're, you're a new person, you know, you have a new normal, something less than you were before, whether it's a traumatic brain injury or amputation or whatever. And, um, you know, working with those individuals, it's a totally different mindset as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, Daryl and Turning Point. Turning Point is a documentary that if you, want, you go there, go to Dive Heart, go to Turning Point and watch it, you'll learn all about Daryl. Daryl is a Vietnam vet with a spinal cord injury who, uh, it was amazing how this has turned his life around. You were going to say? I was just going to bring up Jessica also. I don't know her last name, but the one born with no arms. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jessica Cox, yeah. Pilot. Put yeah. her whole rig together, putting it on. Oh, yeah. with their toes. Learned how to fly an airplane. Get to Chicago to learn how to dive with just her feet. Yeah, she flew a private plane with her feet. 
And it was amazing. She assembled, disassembled her gear, did her mask, did everything with her feet. And then she could even put her contacts in with her feet. And then she said, the only thing I can't do is I can't do a ponytail. I said, well, I can't help you there. <laughs> so um, this next piece we're going to see is, is an incredible story. We had, we, we've been so blessed. Last year we had three documentaries. Um, one was um, shot in Cozumel, and, and it was just about dive hard in general and the divers with disabilities we had on the trip. And on that particular trip, we had five quadriplegics. Um, and they came from all over the country. And I didn't know any of them. I had never been in the water with these people before. These are teams that I had trained around the country, instructors that said, we'll do the class, we'll do the pool, and we'll send you to gym, you know, in Cozumel. And I'm like, okay, guys, you know, and, and Dave, you were on that trip, I think. Were you, no, you weren't on that one? It was, uh, <laughs> you know, talk about learning on what the fly. We, uh, I trained all the instructors and dive masters at uh, Dive Paradise, and they're the large, largest dive operator in Cozumel. And uh, we stayed at Hotel Cozumel, and Hotel Cozumel, when we started, didn't have any accessible rooms at all. Now they have 10 wheelchair accessible rooms, thanks to our going there. And, and that's, you know, it's gonna take a while. Most of the world's not accessible. It's gonna take a while to bring the, the, the world along, but it's gonna happen. I mean, with this kind of publicity, it's gonna create demand, and that demand is gonna occur at dive shops, and people are gonna walk into dive shops and say, I wanna do this. And chaps are going to say either, yeah, we'll, we can help you, or no, you have to go somewhere else. And if they go somewhere else, that's money walking out their door. So, and with organizations like Rotary and Grants and, you know, getting the community involved, and that's what we do a lot of is teaching these teams like in, uh, you know, in, in, in Michigan and stuff where Ken is, you know, how this is really good for your business. And we have a whole program we're developing called the Business of Adaptive Scuba, and we help people learn how to really make money and, and make this a community effort, get everybody involved. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, and as far as the dive shops are concerned, I think they only see the tip of the iceberg. They only see the, the persons who are disabled. And how much can we really make off a disabled person? I don't feel good about this or whatever. But really, talk about bringing your dive mastership to a whole new level. Talk about getting divers who stop diving because I'm bored. Okay, well now you've given them the ultimate challenge. You're diving for two. You're di you know, you're diving for two. And I, I don't think we've really hit that as much as we should because we got to get the board divers. I think we'll help the industry. I think it's one of the things that'll help galvanize the industry is get the board divers back into diving, helping people. People want to volunteer. They want to do something. This is perfect for them to put their skills to use. Yeah, absolutely. People want to give back. I mean, that's what I've found in this. And it's, it's, you know, over the next few days, we'll be at Our World Underwater and thank, you know, Pat Hammer and everybody here at Our World Underwater for making this available for us because uh, they're, they're a sponsor of this as well. But, um, but you know, we'll meet people and, and it's amazing, you know, the responses that they have. And, and, and we've had tech divers, you know, who are bored. Great example. You know, they'll, they'll come up and go, you know, I, I just kind of tired of you know doing the same old same old and 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 until you get in the, in the pool with a, somebody with a disability and it really really will change your your perspective and 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 change your life um so so back to cozumel um i met this one quadriplegic gentleman whose name is uh, alex and he's an army vet with a spinal cord injury uh c5 and he fell in love with his now wife, but fell in love with his physical therapist when he was going through rehab in law, at the Long Beach VA. And I learned this, and then I learned that they had actually been referred to me by a, one of the instructors I trained in Long Beach. And so they got married during scuba class. And then I did their open water dives in Cozumel. So, I mean, he, this kind of flies in the face of what's going on. I mean, guys are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're, they're losing their fiancés, and their, their, their marriages are going to hell, and they're committing suicide, and they're, they're drugging, and they're, they're drinking, and they're just kind of checking out, and they don't want to bother people. They'd rather, you know, push, push everybody away and stuff. And here's a guy who fell in love during you know during his therapy and then got married and scuba now has opened up his life and I had most after diving with them in Cozumel I had the most incredible letter from his wife the occupational therapist who said this has brought us closer together and it said also um, this is the first time that he's been pain free since his injury so it, it was amazing so this is this, this I think it's a scuba love story of Alex and um, 
Alex and Julie from Long Beach. The learning curve for swimming is this. The learning curve for scuba enough? diving is this. We can take someone with a disability over 15, 20 minutes, have them moving underwater independently. Yes, with the control of buoyancy a little bit. But what happens then is they're a scuba diver. So now it's Johnny in the wheelchair becomes Johnny the scuba diver, and he's empowered. He believes he can do additional things in life. He takes on new challenges. And, and that's what diving does for people with disabilities. Zero gravity environment. And that's what we found dive is. It's not just a feel good thing. 
is not just building confidence, independence, and self-esteem, but it's actually a therapy. So now, it's inherently hyperbaric. So individuals go down and they, they feel pressure. That's why kids with autism have such an incredible response to this, almost immediately on every pro session. What we can do is give an individual oxygen therapy, hyperbaric therapy, and physical therapy in a zero-gravity environment. Now, that's very powerful. And we're at a point where this is just starting. And when we start doing research and, and looking at outcomes, I think we're going to blow the doors off of what's out there for people with disabilities and rehabilitation. The proof, however, is in the results. And according to Alex and Julie, they are nothing short of miraculous. If Alex has pain all the time, 100% of the time in his left shoulder, and that's the only time since I've known him that he says he's pain free in the water. When the second time I got out of the water, I had not only not any pain, but I felt stronger in both my arms. And we talked about it around that day, saying, well, maybe we should get not in the ocean, Long Beach, but in the pool, where the tank can do a few laps like every couple of times a week, because it totally strengthened my shoulder within two dives. We we're definitely doing it because it's therapeutically beneficial, and we just get to have fun about it. The best thing I saw in the water is Alex swimming and moving around and moving his arms more than I ever see on land and just having more of a sense of freedom. So the best thing I saw this week. What may be even more important is the effect scuba diving has on the entire spectrum of the couple's lives, alone and together. I remember growing up, uh, watching uh, watching fish go by me and just jumping in the warm water. And, and I think once I, you know, I had my accident, I thought like, if anything, that would be unattainable. And in this trip, I've seen turtles, I've seen fishes, and I've had the opportunity to regain what I've lost during my childhood which is awesome. It just brings me back and it just opens up a, just a chapter in my life that I not miss, but I kind of neglected because of my disability. But now it's open, so it's kind of, it's huge. We all know that life can be cool, but if your heart is big enough, there's always a path to a better place. We've been in precarious situations many times, and uh, I've always trusted her with my life, but being 60 feet down, I needed help, and she doing it without me asking because I can't talk in the water. Um, but she kind of reassured me that she knows who I am, like she just looked in my eyes and went and become present. She was just around me the first day. So that opens up, that opens up a bit. It just reassures me that I know who I am, and I know who she is. We are to that. You can Sorry about the audio on that. That was kind of garbled, wasn't it, a little bit? So I thought that was, that was great at the end, uh, you know. So, that, I mean, here's a couple that came together. Uh, and, and again, he talked about hope, right? Um, I'm going to kind of move through this a little bit faster because I want to give Mark plenty of time to talk and I want to have a chance for uh, questions and maybe a little bit more input from some of the people that have had some experiences with what we're doing. So um, what I'd like to do is um, any questions on that or comments on, on, on that piece? This is... Um, this was just a year ago, December. This is a young man with a C5 um, spinal cord injury. His name is, uh, we don't need to hear water, right, in the background. So this is, uh, this is J2, or John. He was an extreme sports athlete who was injured in a, in a cycling accident. And he's in a power chair. If you look at his hands, his hands 
are really can't, his digits don't work very well, although he is able to move a joystick around. And he actually does have a, still has a, a nonprofit that, that he has created that takes individuals with really involved disabilities like he has and gets them back into um, some high speed motoring, you know, in, in different types of vehicles and stuff. But this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is probably about 40 or 50 feet of water. Find, we found a nice flat area so we didn't have to navigate or negotiate the coral reef at all. And once we were able to, to adjust his buoyancy and get him squared away where he found the sweet spot and he was neutrally buoyant, then he was able to with what movement he had. And now, now J2 can only feel from his elbows up. So what movement he has, he's using it, man. He's giving it everything he has. And with the help of the current, you know, in Cozumel, now he's going somewhere, right? Paradise Gardens, probably. What's that? Paradise Gardens, yeah, par yeah, dive, yeah, the Paradise Reef, yeah, exactly. And we always have two divers in the water, at least. Uh, and there's the other instructor on the other side. We're always at least a fin kick away. Or, or you know, close enough to grab him if there's a problem and all. And, and we're watching the regulator like a hawk. Obviously, that's uh, the biggest concern we have. But once we get him weighted properly, and you can see the, the weighting scenario we have there a little bit, you got clip-on weights that are hanging from D-rings, and you've got some weights on his ankles. And we always use integrated BCDs because that gives us more options to, to place weights in places that um, where we can get somebody trimmed out, somebody who might have atrophied legs, or somebody who might uh, have an amputation, you know, Tammy Duckworth's a great example, you know, one, one leg at the hip, the other leg at the knee, you know, she was kind of doing one of these in the water, and we took her wetsuit and we flipped it up over her stub and we duct taped it, you know, and then we, uh, we put an anchor weight in there and we got her trimmed out where she was, you know, right where she wanted to be. But um, he was one of three guys that came up to me on this trip the second day and said, Jim, we couldn't figure out why we felt so euphoric, and once we realized that we were pain free for the first time since our injury. And, and I just said to him, I said, get in line. Cause I mean, this is, this is, this is the future. This is physical therapy in a zero gravity environment. And it's not about going to the Caribbean all the time. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. But what our goal is, is to build a facility here in the Midwest, 30 to 45 minutes from O'Hare and Midway Airport, that's 100 feet deep, that's 90 degrees, where we can do research, rehabilitation, education, training, and provide vocational opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And I say vocational opportunities, and you, you saw Stephanie Dominici in the NBC piece when we were down in the Keys. Stephanie is majoring in underwater archaeology. She started with us at a Shriners Hospital therapy pool. You know, she can't wear fins, or she can't, she does wear fins sometimes. Sometimes they'll wear fins just to be like everybody else. You know what I mean? But, but they can't use them functionally. So she uses hand fins, but she's a rescue diver. And she, uh, she just got a job offer in Panama as a diver. So and we also have dive masters that are, have you know, installed uh, underwater turbines in the Gulf Stream off of Fort Lauderdale. Underwater turbines, that's like windmills underwater. That's, gold, that's free energy. You know, I mean, that's, this is a current that's here all the time in Cozumel, right? And off the coast of Florida. And so I imagine if we could have people with disabilities working on projects where they're, under, they're, they're installing underwater turbines and things like that, producing clean energy and pumping it back to shore. I mean, that, you know, you're helping the environment, you're helping the individual. You know, if they get a paycheck, now you're helping the economy, right? Now they're paying taxes and stuff. So that's kind of, the, that's kind of a, a dream of ours, a vision of ours, but I think it's very realistic. Um, and if we work hard enough and we get enough help from folks like you in sharing the story and, and um, helping to go forward, then, then that's, uh, I think that, that can occur. So, you about ready? Sure. Okay, great. Any, any questions? I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? Any questions on anything we've done so far or comments or? Where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? Yeah, do you, uh, do you want to take, we want to take like a two minute break? Let's do that. Too far from uh, Dive Hard headquarters. And uh, this quarter I was teaching applied neuro. I'd rather be doing this. I would have rather been doing this all quarter. So uh, but anyways, I want to thank, uh, thank you for, thank Jim, uh, thank Tina. Uh, thank all of you for being here, what you do for Dive Hard and with Dive Hard. Uh, thank my wife for letting uh, me bring her today here. <laughs> um, so she knows what we've been doing uh, for so long. Uh, I usually, when I talk about things and things I'm excited about, like research and stuff, and um, 
with scuba diving um, in particular, I have it be more conversational. And so I'm going to go through some information for you. I know I made some notes earlier. I actually made more notes on here than I have PowerPoint slides. Um, but there was a comment that Jen made about, uh, what was it, story stick, but uh, what is it, story statistics? Right, OK, well, story sticks, OK, well, guess what? I got to show some stats today. But the good news is, is hopefully down the road, we're setting the stage and the foundation so that we can actually validate scientifically um, what it is everybody's doing. And we know whether we do or not, it's ultimately you're going to still do what you do, right? So you're still going to be work with, working with Jim um, and making differences in people's lives. We just hope we can show it um, uh, a bit more. So um, as I said, um, my name is Mark Kovic. I um, do, um, I've been an occupational therapist for about 15 years. I've been teaching for three and a half years. And do you know, other than the uh, Jim's reference to occupational therapy, do any of you know what occupational therapists are do? you're going to get a crash course in it. <laughs> um, occupational therapists look at how somebody performs activities during the day, any kind of daily activity, anything from diving to bathing to dressing to eating, anything you might do during the day in an environment um, and something that they want to do. And ultimately, what, it, what ends up happening is, is how an occupational therapist adapts the environment or the activity for that person and that's essentially what we learn how to do. That's what I teach. And it's a perfect fit for Dive Heart because that's really what you're doing. So I'm kind of a, uh, about how long ago did we meet, Jim? A couple years ago? Yep, a couple years ago. Um, Jim approached me and actually was, he was looking to do some research and kind of validate some of the work that he's doing. Was put in contact with a physiologist at Midwestern University. Um, and uh, he actually, I think, um, Paul McAuliffe came to Dive Heart, actually. They had a discussion, uh, Jim had a discussion with them. And what ended up happening was, uh, eventually, I was introduced to Jim. Um, some of the physiological research that's being done, tons of research that's being done with people with disabilities, um, and even without disabilities, um, is being done at Duke University. Uh, Jim had some presenters here last year for that. But what's not been done at all is looking at quality of life for people with disabilities with adapted scuba diving. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let's kind of go into just some of the information here and kind of set you up for that. In order to do any type of research, we have to go through an ethics process. That's the Institutional Review Board, the IRB, and we have that approved at Midwestern University. That just happened just this last fall. Um, it was a year ago today we were sitting in this very room, I think, and actually talking about the plans for this. And finally, a year later, have moved uh, forward that information. Um, we're, it's a pilot study. What we're doing is, and the plan, what I'm showing you today is, is that we have permission, thanks to Tina um, and company and Jim, and then our, our ethics board approval, to look at all of the data that Jim has that Dive Heart has. All the people that have been seen by Dive Heart for as long as Dive Heart's been around that there's data on. So I'll show you some of those numbers today. And then we're going to use that as a, ca a way to kind of categorize and move forward and looking at how we can collect some more data on quality of life. OK, so I'll give you those numbers in a bit. But this is what we're looking to do. Um, and really to just quantify and categorize those people being served, really get a scope for the appreciation of what's being done. Uh, current status of the study, the, um, I had two of my students that were collecting data. Uh, again, Jim and Tina were quite nice enough to allow them to come by um, and collect some data. Was just, I think I have the date correct, you could probably validate this, on February 8th, so very recently. It was just like a week ago, I guess, right? Okay. Um, they came for the last time and collected the last of the data, um, and we're currently under review. So I've not done much with it in the last week, <laughs> uh, but know that um, uh, there's a lot to look at. I want to point out, um, and I don't think, to my knowledge, at least publicly, Jim's talked quite a bit about the data collection and what he does um, at Dive Heart and, and, the, and what, um, what Tina does as well, too. It's a big, huge file cabinet of data, of files of people, like literally this big type thing, um, and also electronic uh, spreadsheets that have all the data on it. Um, and so what the students did is they worked along with Tina and kind of made sure that they were categorized and everything was up to date. So they do excellent record keeping. <laughs> so no worries on that. Um, all right, so that's the background. That kind of sets the stage. Well, I actually already said this. Sets the stage for they, they both keep an electronic and hard copy database. Um, ultimately, what happened was is that when Jim and I started having these discussions um, a year ago, 
um, it was his agreement to start to collaborate with somebody. And I'm glad that he approached Midwestern and I became a part of it, but to allow us to have access to Dive Heart. Um, it's, as you know, if you know Jim uh, New or if you've known him for a while, it's very dear to his heart and to share that information is pretty important to us. Um, and I know it is to him too. The data that I'm showing you here and the data that we've collected, um, again with help from Tina, is the most current, most comprehensive database to our knowledge of everything that Dive Heart has and to the numbers that you're going to see here um, in the next slide, I believe it is, um, more than anywhere else in the entire world. There's no collection of data of resources like this. So as one of my colleagues likes to say, with enough of that information, let's get to the sexy part of it. Let me show you some of the data that I have. So preliminary data. As of now, there are 753 people that have been served by Dive Heart. So I think that deserves some applause. <laughs> Good job. Um, I've categorized some of the conditions. I have not included all of them here. There's a list of about 50 different conditions. I just kind of pulled some of the big ones out so you can kind of have an idea. Um, and I want to point out also what my students did and what we did is we used the data and the data collection that Diveheart uses. We did not impose, is not the right word, but we didn't come in and say we wanted to be done this way or categorize it this way. We worked with what Diveheart had and we'll use that going forward. So of those 753 participants, um, about 12, 12 and a half or so percent, almost 100 of them had multiple diagnoses. And for the sake of today, I didn't have time to go through and categorize as to what they are. So at some point in time, somebody identified they have this and this, right? So they might have a brain injury um, or a spinal cord injury, some combination. And then what I did is I categorized, again, the big numbers here, the big categories, um, the ones that uh, you might be more familiar with, at least from a tr uh, terminology standpoint. So TBI is short for traumatic brain injury. Um, there were 22 of those, about 3%. Um, amputations, again, amputations was not uh, classified as to if it's a single amputation, double, um, triple, quadruple, upper, lower extremity, just the numbers right now. So that's 31. Uh, Down syndrome, uh, 20. Blind, visually impaired, about 14%, a little bit more than 100. Autism spectrum disorder, um, 59. And then spinal cord injury was grouped into two different subcategories. Uh, spinal cord injury is about 100, uh, so around that 12.75% uh, again. Most of them being paraplegics, that would be two limbs involved, and then quadriplegics, meaning uh, some combination of four limbs involved. Um, in case you're not familiar with either by diving um, or, or the conditions alone, kind of keep in mind with uh, spinal cord injury, based on that level of injury in the spine, um, para or quad could mean implications of two limbs or four limbs, but it doesn't mean complete paralysis necessarily. Worst case scenario, like a Christopher Reeve, where his injury was at, he did not have any, um, he was quadriplegic and had no use of the limbs. Uh, but could be your shoulders. It depends on whether, exactly, yes. So that last video that Jim showed, uh, that I believe it looked like about a C5, C6 level, is that about the level of injury. So there was some shoulder movement and no sensation below that. So I suspect, hypothetically, that if we played those out a little bit more, we might get more variabilities as to how somebody performs. But we'll have to see as time goes on. So those are the numbers. Any questions about these? Yeah. What's that? Oh, I do. Okay, see, she knows my slides better than I do. I just did this. Uh, okay, here we go. That answers the question. <laughs> um, so there we go. So of that number, so let's go back. Can I go back a slide? Do I just go up? Of those 753, loosely a third of them um, were listed with this unknown or other. And again, that's a category that was in there that Dive Heart's done. Um, we've not gone into any further as to, as to what that is. Um, in those lists of 50 different conditions, um, some of those are the congenital ones. And there's quite a few within there. I did not actually bring that with me today. So let's say there's probably at least a dozen or 15 different types of them. The numbers were low enough. In other words, of those 753, there was maybe five or 10 of each condition. Very important, um, but I didn't want to have a long, 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 long slide with that. So where does that kind of leave us is, is that um, I'm hoping that we can continue to have that relationship with Dive Heart, and I suspect we are going forward. Um, and 
we, this is a stopgap we have starting as of January 1st. This is the data uh, that DiveHeart has. So anybody that continues on, any new people that join DiveHeart, any new people that then participate in any activities with DiveHeart, will add to that number and we'll collect that going forward. Um, what also is going to happen is, is that, is Lisa going to be talking here in a bit, Jim? Oh, video from her, okay. So what you're going to see is, is a video from uh, Lisa uh, uh, De Pascal, and she had created an online survey that we're going to incorporate as the next steps in the research process. So how these two are going to come together is, is when somebody comes to DiveHeart, or Jim goes to them and they, they participate, um, obviously DiveHeart's going to collect their data. So they'll get the information that will add to those numbers. They will then be asked at that point in time, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there, if they want to participate in the research study, and that research, they'll have to sign a, a that's what the ethics board is, make sure that they're not, they don't have to be in the research when they're working with DiveHeart. But if they agree to, um, they would complete a study. And what we're hoping to, uh, a questionnaire, what we're hoping to collect is, is a pre-post measure of quality of life. And that's really what we're looking at at this point in time. And I should take a little bit, uh, a little bit more time to talk about this idea of quality of life. Um, because there's so many different things out there to measure, you got to make a decision to kind of go some, or start from somewhere. Um, but there's so much research looking at physiology um, of normal divers and then uh, people with disabilities. When I did a lit review, I sat down, I was getting all excited, got my desk together, got my internet ready, got everything ready, and I got my lit review ready. You know how many articles I found to talk about uh, quality of life for people with disabilities with scuba diving? Any guesses? Not zero. One. I know I set it up for that, didn't I? Absolutely one. And so, <laughs> absolutely, there you go. Um, well, so, and so just like Jim says, for many different ways, the, the timing is ripe. I mean, this is perfect for it. And again, you're going to do what you're going to do, but one study with all this. And again, we know that anecdotally, there's differences. I heard a couple stories earlier. You see the smiles, you see the, you hear the pain free. All that is happening. That's not to be questioned. It's that can we link it um, in a non-bias or at least decreased bias kind of way. And that's where I kind of come in a little bit biased in regards to I'm a scuba diver and I want people to get better and as such, but um, in this regard I kind of separate myself from that process and look at it in that um, unbiased way. Um, and as Jim said, the intent being is that potentially hopefully down the road one study leads to multiple studies to larger studies. If we're at 753 now, what's to say we can't get that number even larger? And the larger the N is, the larger that number, the more valid the results are. Right, so then that's kind of what we're hoping for. So in a short amount of time that could lead, or even a longer amount of time that could actually even lead to, um, uh, to grants and such like that too. So that kind of validates this, this gut feeling that I think you all have and that you've seen um, definitely. There's a lot of questions to ask and I'm not gonna bring them up today. I will welcome definitely questions or thoughts you may have because it might help me in um, looking at the next steps of organizing the research. Um, but we can go condition specific we can look at, like I said, spinal cord injury, different levels of spinal cord injury. There's different types of brain injury. There's different levels of stroke. There's the autism spectrum. There's so many different uh, condition specific uh, variables involved. There's a lot of really cool things I think that we can, we can definitely do to, to show that. I um, mean, again, details about that quality of life piece is gonna come from uh, Lisa's uh, uh, video presentation. What I have, why I, why I chose quality of life is a lot of my clinical and research work up till now has looked at quality of life for people uh, wanting to live in the community and uh, uh, being the best they can be, doing everything that they can um, as much as possible. The hard part with that is, is there's, a, uh, there's a word that describes that. They're called intangibles. Because how do you define quality of life, right? I mean, is it, is it, as Jim said, being able to get up in the day, being able to get here for the presentation? It's very nebulous to define and very hard to define. There's a number of measures out there that look at quality of life that are very valid. And we've kind of built some of what we're going to look at for these questions um, on that research that's out there. So although there's one study up till now that looks at quality of life for people with disabilities with scuba diving, there's a lot of measures out there looking at that. So you'd still, if you're a volunteer and such, you'd still be doing the work that you're doing. This just becomes an added piece we would collect to it. And again, the intent is gonna be that we would do a pre-post. 
So they would, they would start again with, with Dive Heart. They'd, they'd sign up, they'd collect all that information, collect that data. Um, then uh, they do the, uh, they do the pretest or a pre-questionnaire, answer questions about how satisfied they are with their quality of life, do the diving sessions, however that is for them, uh, and then immediately afterwards do a, a follow-up. So then we actually have those differences in numbers to kind of pull from, and that's kind of what we're hoping on, uh, hoping to move forward with. So that's all I have. Jim gave me 20 minutes. I know it wasn't going to take nearly that long. Uh, so again, I want to send my uh, appreciation to uh, Dive Heart and to Jim and to my two students. I told them I would recognize uh, Kelly Hayne and uh, Shane Allen for the work that they've done uh, and for Tina for, um, and Jim for letting them uh, be part of that. Um, I think that's it. Do you have any questions for me? Any other thoughts? Is Midwestern University, is that around here? I'm in, I'm in yes, uh, Midwestern's in Downers Grove. Oh, it's in Downers It's actually oh. just north of Dive Heart. Yep. Can't quite walk to Dive Heart from there, but uh, yeah. Mark, what is the ultimate goal with the research and quality of life? And I know we were looking at kids with autism specifically. Oh, right, that's true. That's a Kelly good point. And are Kelly and Shane are doing a research uh, study. So, quick side story: um, our students are required to do research projects um, at the master's level uh, for them to uh, graduate. And uh, Kelly Shane are two of three students that are doing research looking at one subcategory, and that's, uh, I think, children on the autism <coughs> uh, um, in the spectrum. In the spectrum um, of those that category of numbers that I showed you. Um, so they're working with a research um, advisor, um, my boss actually, the program director, and they're starting to look at that. I don't know the details of that. Actually, I don't know much about that. The details you have you? What I know is that we've we've sent out. Um, an email to people that we've identified that were, were have participants or the participants themselves that are on the autism spectrum asking if they would like to participate in the study. I know we've had five or six people who contacted us back and said yes we'd love to participate and trying to include that and then the next step is to invite the um, buddies and instructors who work with these children uh, or different participants even the adult uh, people and um, ask if you guys would like to be um, participate in focus groups because they, they'd like to get a group of the, the Dive Heart buddies together so that they could give their anecdotal stories. So um, we're working on both of helping them get the word out and then they'll be the ones doing the um, organizing and, and question, you know, do the, the study themselves. And it worked out for the students because then they were already collecting the data and then they're also doing the research in it, so it kind of worked right. out for them. So um, but it would be neat then to see, and that's just an incomplete list that I gave you of some of those conditions to do that same type of research. Um, again, pre post with all these conditions, or many of them, we can start to kind of see if there's similarities across types of conditions. Um, the goofy research things that excite me. So I don't know. But ultimately, I think hopefully that will validate um, a lot of what you do. I didn't put up here, though, my email address or my contact information. I don't mind leaving that with you. Um, if you'd want, feel free to, or you can actually contact me through Jim. So I can give that to you now um, if you'd like. Um, my, my work email address, it's M. Kovic. It's my first initial uh, last name at midwestern.edu. And Jim had all the pictures and all the graphs, so I, I was safe from having any, so I don't have any of that exciting stuff there. Yes? So how do you take the bias out of quality of life? What's that? How do you take the bias out of quality of life? Aha, the bias out of quality of life. Well, there's no exact measure in taking that bias out of it because there's inherent, especially when it's uh, client-centered. In other words, if I'm asking you about your quality of life, you're inherently going to probably score yourself kind of high or if you're a type A personality, potentially kind of low. So how you tease that out is, is through multiple measures um, or through a lot of different people. So then that statistically plays out. That's the boring statistics piece of it. So next time you can let me know if you can ask me a question before you enter. <laughs> <laughs> we drove here the whole way from Hoffman like State, her. so. <laughs> Anything else? Yo, Mark is a, is a diver. I know that you're a researcher, so you can't, you know, I know they don't like to speculate a lot, uh, but what, what, is your, what do you think about this? Is, is, what do you think the results are going to be, I mean, you know, in the long run for, for this, is a therapy? 
I always have, so Jim's question was, is, you know, it's kind of that gray area and a very pointed question. Are we filming? Is this going to end up on the internet? No, I always put a caveat out there because I think we have to be cautious. Um, I like to say cautiously optimistic. There's always a possibility, not quite even talking about not preparing beforehand. Uh, Jim asked the question, though. There's always a possibility that some of the research might show that there's not big differences from a statistical measure that validate what's happening from a quality of life issue, at least that regard. But there's so many different things to look at, and it's that measure is only as strong as the measure itself. Right? So my answer to that is, is that I know something's happening. It's finding the right, me I, my gut tells me it is, anecdotally. I see it. I mean, how can you not, right? But what is that? I think we need the right measure with the right combination of all those variables to kind of look at that. And we're starting with that now. So we're just at the beginning of it. So that's the best you're going to get from me. <laughs> but I do, there's something going on. It's just a matter of how we tease that out. So, but this is a good starting point because, again, the work you've been doing, the volunteers that are here, the work Jim uh, and, and company have been doing is there's not this great number. I mean, almost a thou, 300, 750, uh, three quarters of a thousand uh, people have been with Dive Heart. I mean, that's just an amazing thing over a little bit more than a decade. Okay. So that's just an amazing thing. So imagine um, how that can go larger. Um, there's also the possibility because of Jim's collaborations as well to think about the possibility of, um, I, you know, if you talk about adaptive training, and I've, I've not really talked to Jim about this, is, is that everyone that you talk to in different organizations um, and you educate them, are they training the same way as you? In other words, you said you were just in Israel. If they're going through with that and they're doing it the same way, are they doing it differently? Those are questions uh, researchers sign, uh, to kind of ask, right? So that, because if they're doing it differently and they're getting different results, I kind of want to know that, right? Um, but then that increases your numbers and stuff. But anyways, those are the, the boring stats piece of it, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Republish with your license. You want to help these people, but you don't want to appear to be volunteering because you want to be a good person. You want to be doing it because it's the right thing to do. Is it at all, at all honest? Yeah, get over it. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, yeah. Do it for the right reasons. Just get over it. I'll do it. Do it. Do it. Show business. That's what you're trying to avoid. Well, kind of. I mean, it's sort of. So what I do is I work with people who are doing it and tell them, hey, I'm just here going to take pictures. I'm here going to Facebook, Facebook for you. I'm going to here try to be a genuine in the moment. And when you're genuine in the moment, everything else kind of goes away, right? That's what he said. Good, get over it. Yeah, just get over it. Do yeah, it. Get over it. Get over it and do it. But at the same time, uh, it's hard. I'll give you an example, and maybe you can relate to this. All right? Um, I've gone to the four conferences so far, and I've met probably 25 people, 50 people per conference. That's over 200 people. Right? And I said, hey. Work with me. Here's my cards, which I didn't bring this time. It shows you how jaded I am. And by the way, I'm leaving right now. Um, and I'm not going to hand out my cards because I haven't yet to be contacted by one person after it's all over who said, I want to help you tell your story. I think you're wonderful volunteers, but it's made my job to cover you incredibly difficult because they don't like sharing their story. Um, so it's that's why we're here. We're here to help you share show your story. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank you for the cue. It was a good, it was a good opportunity. Um, and I hate to be jaded and say it's never going to happen, but that's why I go to these things and participate to help people do what I do. That's what I do. Well, thank you, and thank you for your support and helping us share our no story. Worries. And I know you got a booth to get yeah, to. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. What's going on with our network? Um, not working. Um, I just heard from, from Mark, of course, uh, Kovic from Assistant Professor of Occupational Therapy at uh, Midwestern University. And uh, thank you very much. I was, I was a, I'm really excited about where I think this is going to go. And I know you're all about under promising and over delivering. And I sometimes get excited <laughs> and do the other. Would you mind if I took a moment and followed up with what Rick just said? No, you know, I was going to give you the mic. Do you want to do that now? If you want, but I sure. think it's going to, he really segued into it. He's not here to hear it. Sure, yeah. Why he don't really we do segued that? into it. Why don't we do that? Let's uh, mic up. Uh, Website for scuba diving. We are 
to scuba diving what Facebook is to the rest of the world, except that Google loves us. Google doesn't like Facebook. I'm going to get into that in just a moment, and I promise Jim to keep it really brief. Okay. Now, we just had someone tell us earlier that um, rather than give a speech, he was a little jaded about asking for help in telling the stories because no one had ever contacted him. He'd given out his cards many, many times. Didn't even bring us cards. I don't mention who it is because that's not important. But someone from the media is like saying, I'm not getting media. I'm not getting stories from you. And I think that's tragic. Okay? Now, I am not a reporter. I am not a journalist. Okay? Sometimes I play one. Sometimes I go do reports for things. But really, I don't publish much on Scuba Board. You publish it on Scuba Board. How many of you have read Mark Twain? You know who Mark Twain is? What was the biggest story you remember from Mark Twain? Tom Sawyer. Okay, Tom Sawyer, exactly. Okay, and what was the biggest thing about Tom Sawyer you remember? Painting the whitewashing fence. Whitewashing the fence. Okay, who painted that fence? It wasn't Tom Sawyer. Okay, it wasn't Tom Sawyer. Jim has been carrying Dive Heart on his shoulders. Okay, shame on us. I'm not saying you guys haven't done a lot. Okay, I think you're doing great. But as far as promoting media, Jim has done the predominant amount of work for Dive Heart. And so, you know, we expect it of him because he's a professional. That's what we want him to do. He's good at it. He's passionate about it. But he's Jim. And every time Jim talks, people say, well, he's special. We get it. Okay? I don't mean special in a bad way. I mean, he, we, we look at him. He's a hero. He's a definite hero. Now, Jim is great, but he's only one person. He's only one person. And social media has to get social for it to work. And I'm going to preach to you here, okay? Social media has to get social for it to work. And in order for Dive Heart to improve, the numbers of people it can serve, including the number of volunteers we have coming into Dive Heart, means you have to get social. And you have to get the people you serve to get social. And what do I mean by that? What do you think share. I mean by that? Share, share, share the posts. Share the posts. Sharing the post is good, but you've got to get people the right to post. You gotta, you gotta encourage people to get out there. And what our friend was sort of disgruntled about: tell your story, tell their story. Um, you know, I forgot to bring it up here. How many of you have a GoPro? We have two people with GoPros. Okay, please go out and buy one. I think GoPro. It's it's a little camera. It's about this big. You can put them on a helmet. I've got mine on a little camera tray. What an awesome way to start, to start getting other people to tell their story. Because you know what? If you take a picture of a disabled person and put it up on the internet, who's going to talk about it? They are. Their friends are. Their mom, their dad, their significant others are all going to talk about that. And this is starting to get social with social media. Okay? You've got to talk. You've got to get them to talk. Okay, and I'm not asking you just to do it on scuba board. I think you should do it on scuba board, you know. But, you know, there's all sorts of forums out there. There's Facebook. There's Twitter. This should be, we should be lighting up the airways with Dive Heart, with Adaptive Scuba. Look what could be done. Look what should be done. And why should we do that? Why do you, why do you think that's going to matter? Nobody? We, we remove the excuse. Because when we look at Jim and we see hero, we look at everybody else, they're not heroes. Okay, they might have the GoPro hero, okay, but I'm not talking about that. But when we see Joe and Jill Diver going out of their way, who's really not that special, they're, they're not Jim Elliott, okay? We're showing the world that everyone can make a difference. You know, now I tell you, when Jim invited me to go do the training, I was like, why would blind people want to go diving? What in the world is significant about this? Okay, and then I went in the pool blind. Oh my God, 
It was great. It was absolutely awesome. You know, I came away a better diver because of that. And as I was looking at that, I was thinking, you know, how fun it was and how diving for a lot of people has just lost its fun. You know, they've got to plan these long things to uh, go somewhere to actually have fun when they've got a pool in their neighborhood that they can be helping people with. They'll feel much better about themselves. And where, again, our friend was saying, you know, I don't want to do it for the wrong reasons. No, just do it. I, I don't care. Jim, do you care why anyone helps people out? Not See, I don't either. The point is that when you get out there, you're showing the world that a single person can make a difference. And they don't have to be special. They don't have to be a hero. They don't have to be a super saiyan. They don't have to be a rock star. And that's what social media is all about. That's what social media is best at. Showing that what is abnormal can be normal. What is, you know, happens very rarely can happen quite often. And really, if I can impart anything to you today, is to get on those keyboards. Get the people, you know, I mentioned it earlier when we are talking about they're planning a trip to Cozumel. Get the people going to Cozumel, ask them, you know, have you posted on your blog today if they have a blog? Have you posted on Scootboard? Have you posted on Facebook? You know, because that's really what you want to do is you want them to start building up the hype, building up the hype, then they go do it. You've taken your GoPro and you've got video up on, on it and you've got it on video on uh, YouTube, excuse me, and now you have the whole world starting to go and hit you, and hit you. And let me tell you, it, YouTube is the most underrated thing. I know everybody's about Facebook, but Facebook has never crashed scuba board. YouTube has. We had a person lose a camera in, in uh, Aruba, okay, and it floated to the surface on a floaty camera, and a turtle tried to eat it. And it got caught on his flipper. And trying to get it off, it turned the camera on. So now we got turtle cam. No turtle porn, just turtle cam. And this turtle is swimming around the Gulf of Mexico, and he finally gets the silly thing off, and it keeps floating. And it winds up all the way in Key West, where an astute Coast Guard inspector sees, why, there's a camera floating in the water. And he goes and gets the camera out, and he starts looking at it, and it's like, I don't read Dutch. I have no idea about reading Dutch, so what does he do? He goes on to scuba forums, which one of them was scuba board, and starts posting these pictures. And people said, wow, I know that. And he posted the turtle cam on YouTube. And people really started getting into it there. And they said, if you have any idea, please come out over here on scuba board or one of the other ones. And they came in droves, OK? Well, then you know, the agencies found out about it. The, uh, uh, the, uh, um, it's going to come out. Networks found out about it. We got blown on the network. Oh, camera. Oh, and I forgot to tell you the story. It got connected to the owner in Holland. It was in Aruba. So the camera went back to the person who originally owned it. You know, how whack is that? You lose a camera in Aruba, you pick it up in Key West, and it gets back to you in Holland. That's social media. If you don't understand the power of social media, that's really what it's all about. You know, that would never happen in the years by, before the internet. But it can happen now. And when it does, people are going to hear the story, they're going to see the turtle net, they're going to come to it in droves. And really, that's what social media is about. You guys having fun and putting it up on the internet. Because that's really what's going to sell this. And you know, next year, hopefully, we have to have a couple rooms to hold the volunteers just from Chicago here. Okay, and that should be across the entire nation, across the entire world. Okay, I know I've sort of hit you hard on this. Okay, I'm not trying to embarrass anyone or to hurt any feelings, but you've got to get social with your social media and help this man because he's doing a wonderful job. I mean, we, he does, he does. He's doing a great job, but he needs our help and he needs our help in getting the message out and getting everyone else to start talking about it. Make sense? Have any questions? No questions at all? I did that good a job? Uh-oh. Tell us more about, you were talking a little bit about your experience uh, being blind. What about some of the rest of that? How did you get started? Your experience? Well, you know, the first thing I did that night, I went on the scuba board and I go, oh my god, this is really great. Because that's how I felt. You know, and I've had a number of people contacting me saying, 
okay, really, did, you know, were you that really enthusiastic about it? Well, yeah, and I still am. I can't wait to finish the training. I mean, this guy wore me out, you know, um, but it, that was just awesome. Um, most people don't realize that when you become, when you train, you have to learn how to empathize with those you're going to help. And really, if Dive Heart does nothing else, it provides sensitivity training for people who are disabled. Oh my gosh. You know, when I tried to do the CISA with my legs tied and I'm going with my arms like this, you know, I mean, I, I, I was going to die. You know, if it had been me, and it really made me think about, well, what is my role with the people I go diving with? You know, I mean, one of my things that I teach as an instructor is never do a trust me dive, but that's a trust me dive. That's a huge trust me dive. And the more disabled they are, the more of a trust me dive it is. You know, we've, we, these people's lives are in our hands. And while that's, you know, sort of a heavy weight in such a way, to watch the, the uh, result of it is just phenomenal. See people, you know, I didn't get to go on Matt, Matt Stive, Matt Johnston, but I got to watch him promote it on a scuba board and it was amazing. Matt presented a problem for us, actually. In fact, we have the good causes for him on scuba board because he was always hitting everything with it. We had, we had to put something on Matt to control Matt's enthusiasm and that was how we did it. But you know what? I didn't want, I didn't want to squash his enthusiasm. I thought it was great. It was good for diving. And, and the scuba industry today is scratching to figure out how to get business up. And they're overlooking probably the easiest way to do it, the most gratifying way to do it. I, I think that they're missing, they're missing the whole ball here um, by not taking adaptive scuba and taking it to not just the next level, but the, you know, tens of twenties level above it. Because this is a way for scuba divers to give back to the country in a way that few sports can do. Few sports can really do. But you got to get social about it for us to see it happen in our lifetime. Was that okay? On a weekly basis, uh, the program we started in Camp Pendleton. I mean, the, the pool is right there on base, and they're getting Navy corpsmen and Marines and, and in the water all the time, you know, on a weekly basis with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injuries and stuff like that. The, uh, the next piece that we're going to see is uh, Lisa Deepest. We were invited to present at the uh, World Aquatic Health Conference. So Lisa Deepest-Qual, who is working, you've, you've talked to Lisa before, Mark, right, is a physical therapist, and she went to the conference and represented Dive Heart, and she's going to be presenting on the changes in um, uh, physiological, cognitive, and health-related quality of life measures following an introductory scuba diving program for individuals with disabilities, a pilot study. Easy for me to say, right? My title is a bit shorter. Yeah. So. Which very <laughs> and we're thankful. <laughs> yeah, no. um, just a quick aside, what she's going to talk about with the quality of life is a bit more specific than what I was referring to. So it's just linking with that. As of about two weeks ago, she just went through the ethics training at Midwestern, so she could be a co-investigator with the study we're doing. So we're going to combine forces, so to speak, in that regard. Yeah, excellent. I just, and, and how long does it normally take? I just went through it with two. Uh, the, the Several hours. Or, yeah, a couple hours ago. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. With that, we'll uh, we'll let Lisa do some talking here. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today, Dr. Lisa Di Pasquale. Um, Dr. Pasquale has been involved in physical therapy for uh, more than 23 years. She was a naval physical therapy technician for 12 years. Uh, completed a bachelor's degree in PT at Kansas University while in the Naval Reserve. Um, subsequently commissioned in 1987 uh, and served as a naval officer and physical therapist for 15 years. Um, prior to retiring from the Navy, she completed her Doctor of Science with a, a concentration in clinical electrophysi electrophysiology from Rocky Mountain uh, University. And her professional credentials include electrophysiologic specialist board certified, granted uh, by the ABPTS, uh, American Physical Therapy Association, in 93. Uh, program Chair and sec Secretary of the Section on Clinical Electrophysiology. Um, 
the Energy Task Force, Virginia Physical Therapy Association, uh, Virginia Board of Medical Examiners Work Group. Um, she is also uh, involved in the Dive Military uh, Wounded Volunteer uh, Program as coordinator and uh, highly involved in the Dive Heart Foundation. Um, is a graduate program co-chair uh, and clinical electrophysiology doctor of science. Um, after retiring uh, from the Navy completely in 2002, she uh, has since uh, begun a practice as an orthopedic physical therapist in an outpatient setting specializing in neuromuscular, neuromusculoskeletal screening in the workplace, outpatient client community educating, um, and specializing in community outreach programs. Um, and today she's going to be talking to us about changes in physiological, cognitive, and health-related quality of life measures following an introductory scuba diving program for individuals with disabilities, um, a pilot study. So without further ado, uh, welcome to Dr. Dean Pasquale. Just because I was in the Navy, don't presume I know anything about technology. So I'm presuming because I can speak well, you all can hear me. I tend to be a very fast speaker, so I'll try and speak slowly. And that's not to insult anybody, that's just to keep me on par. So if you guys think I'm speaking too quickly, go and we'll slow down. Um, a lot of mouthful, Chris, thanks for having me. I really appreciate speaking um, with the aquatic folks, and I appreciate being here with the National Swimming Pool Foundation. So we get to rub elbows with people out of our own box, and we get to do things with folks that we don't typically hang out with. So it's always an educational and an enhancing experience for me. So I appreciate it, and thank you very much. Um, I'm going to attempt to do this, and the work that we're doing is there's a group of people called Die Heart. I was not a scuba diver. My husband was stationed overseas for two years. I'm going to do a very short segue into how I got into scuba diving, and this is the only place in the world where I can combine my passion for working with people, promoting, yakking, physical therapy, and scuba all under one umbrella. And I get to do it with kids with disabilities, vets with disabilities, able-bodied folks, SEALs, airborne paratroopers that go, I'm a scuba diver, or I'm a mega man, or mega woman, and they go, wow, I have no idea that this was going to be that challenging, because what we do uniquely with diving is we do a lot of task loading, and that's going to come out as we go forward in this. So what we hope to do today is get Lisa to figure out how to do this. This is Greg, and that's his dive buddy, and Greg is a certified diver. He was an active duty Marine that was on his way to Afghanistan. He left his house to drive to get up with his division to get on a plane, and in route, he was hit by a drunk driver. So he never got there. Greg is 27 uh, as of 2012, <coughs> for five years. He has um, an incomplete spinal cord injury, and he has some residual TBI issues. But he is unstoppable in the water. So to watch him is kind of like you get the lump in your throat and you get the, I mean, he's doing a high sign because anybody that knows that does any kind of diving, this is okay. And every time you dive with a buddy, you have to be able to mimic this. And it took great six months in a pool to be able to do this. And so he went from a scale, and this is so far, this is anecdotal. So we're starting to quantify this. We've gone through several different IRB processes. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is very exciting stuff. So, so I'm going to chill. But that's great with this buddy. <laughs> Slow down. <Okay. laughs> these, are our, these are our objectives. We're going to discuss anecdotal evidence. We're going to present some of the paradigms that we've started. And then I'm going to go ahead and talk about some very preliminary findings. So right now what we see is that more and more folks that I'm working with, I tend to favor working with the folks with disabilities. I get such a charge out of working with the kids that they can wrap me around their fingers and then I'm done because it's like, OK, we're going to swim and we're going to school band. We don't do any measurement. But so what we end up finding is that there's a lot of attention with um, doing adaptive activities, return to function, community integration, um, adaptive sports, wounded warrior project, wounded warrior reach out. I mean, everything wounded warrior that they can be, there's a lot of money and a lot of research being funneled into activities for folks that have adaptive needs but that want to be mainstream. So scuba diving is one of the only things that levels the entire playing field. This gentleman just started his second year of medical school. He's um, an Air Force paratrooper was on a motorcycle, was in route to work, and he got um, caught up in a really bad accident where he tried to help, and then he put his bike aside, stepped out of the way, didn't realize that he'd stepped into traffic and was smashed into by a car. So he's a para. He's a high-level para. He's like a TA para, where he is a gentleman that has it, and right now his legs are tied together in the illustration, so he doesn't have to try to troubleshoot them because we ankle weight him so we can kind of defy his buoyancy. So he's 
Mega Man has swim fins on his fingertips, and he's given us a double high five because he's like ready to rock and roll. He like swims the entire length of football fields just for recreation with scuba gear on, and only when he's in the water is he pain free. Now the question is, is why? And that's one of the reasons why Ian is participating in the research, because he wants to understand why he can't just you know, do medical school underwater. <laughs> so we, he's, he's really a high flyer, he's a rock star, so we have been working with different things to try to keep him moving forward so he doesn't make all of his goals. And so far, what we've been able to tell from the standpoint of anecdotal is there's several different categories of benefit. We see physical benefits, we see cognitive benefits, we see physiological benefits. And we all know that the only other place you can be buoyant in a gravity eliminated place is in some kind of space capsule or overseas, in like, in a, not overseas, but in a, a gravity eliminated environment, a test capsule or a moon or in a space project. And that's way too expensive for us to be able to do regular rehab. So what we tend to do is take folks scuba divers. Ian is to the point where he doesn't need a certified buddy to go with him, so his buddy is hanging back, so Ian can be the hand bone in the middle of the camera. So the other individuals that we work with also tell us subjectively that they have greater cardiovascular tolerance. They have way more endurance and way greater stamina. The kids that we work with that have different disorders on the autism spectrum come from being non-communicative to able to very well express themselves. And we've had three kids currently that were in elementary school that went from being in, quote, 90% special needs class to over three years, 90% mainstream class. And we're like, why? So the question keeps coming up as to why. So we're out in the families report that you know the kids are amazingly more communicative, amazingly more expressive, have a ton more affect, and it's like why? So the same you know, question keeps coming up. We started pushing towards some different universities in our area and have done enough different talks that some of the universities are coming back and saying, okay, we need to like answer some of these questions. So that's been we've been starting to form partnerships, which is really nice. Some of the, the intangentials that we see are like, this young man has also an incomplete spinal cord injury and has a lot of spasticity on his right side. He has reasonable function and he can sign his name when he gets out of the pool or out of the, um, from a scuba diving trip. He's buzzed high forever because he's just having such a great time. But the fact that he can sign his name, I'm like, okay, is this pressure or is it, is it greater oxygenation of tissues? Is it greater vascularization? And how do we measure that kind of stuff? And because of folks like Dr. Becker and some of the other researchers and the high-level folks that we've had with them today, we have all the, a neat pathway for some information with immersion. And so we take the immersion piece a little bit deeper. Generally, we don't take folks deeper than they're qualified to go with one or two buddies, which is generally for recreational diving anywhere with our folks, anywhere between 15 and about 60 feet, which would be two hours. We don't tend to do a whole lot. Here's Hambo Greg showing off again. He's just saying, you know, this is really cool. He had a very high level injury, but he was also um, very, very severely depressed. He tried to take his life a couple of times over the last several years. And since diving, he's had no interest in doing anything, getting a job, going into the workforce, and he's his own advocate. And we have something in Chicago called the Brain Injury Clubhouse, and it's a center that works with folks to do um, rework and re-entry, get some job training, and also just collaborativeness and kind of a media brain shed where people can collaborate together to come up with solutions for things. And so what Greg has told me is that he sees himself better able to do things. He's living independently now. His girlfriend and him have just decided to get married. Um, he's back being independent with his ADLs. He has a lot more motivation to participate. And he's an advocate for the Brain Injury Clubhouse. He walks around and does presentations. So, and he has his own transportation where before he was very limited in his ability to get around. Chicago is pretty cool in that we have a mass transportation system that is, is called a pace bus. So folks can get on and off as they need to, as long as that's where the bus is going. Otherwise, they can try to make arrangements. But being in the city, is, a, is Chicago is pretty up to speed on different modes of transportation for folks with disabilities. So what we're looking at is moving into the next phase. If I'm speaking too quickly, you guys have to sh tell me to slow down. So from what we're looking at is we want to look at physiological, we want to look at physical um, benefits, and we also want to do cognitive. There's a myriad of quality of life um, tools, and to work across many populations with the same tool would be to do any one of the populations of folks in this service. So what we've been looking at is trying to work with different physical therapy programs in education, different OT programs, and different 
side new programs or different clinical PhD programs, and we're starting to identify relationships with folks that are becoming dive buddies, and they're adopting some of their students that want to come into the research process, and we're putting together different IRBs looking at hopefully specific pieces and trying to address them with as clean a relationship for that research. Numbers for the, remember I mentioned the N, the numbers for a lot of these studies are very, they're small. You can't really make a lot of, you can stick with your anecdotal absolutely, and you're gonna do that regardless, but there's not enough numbers to kind of back up some of that. Hopefully that will show that. So now that I'm not mic'd, I will say that, but no. Um, <laughs> hopefully we're, we're, we're heading in that direction, and that's the exciting piece about it. It's her outcome measurement, you couldn't see it very well on there, but looking at that quality of life that's an amalgam of different ones, that hopefully will be the thing well too. Um, and that is, is um, um, I'm the chairman of the board of a group called Synapse House. It's virtual right now. We don't have a place in the Chicago area. Um, you could Google, um, you could Facebook like us as well too. But Synapse House, and this is something I've not talked to Jim about, I know it's going to come up today, but thanks Lisa, um, is we're hoping to look at um, how to connect people that want to go back to the community after they acquire a disability, whether it be an adult or a child or anything, in any capacity. Um, especially with those neurological type injuries. And help them to get back in the community and have certain means to connect them to that. And I see the adaptive diving as part of that. Um, so they, they don't ex we don't exist yet um, uh, physically in the Chicago area, but we're gonna be in Tampa and, this, and here as well too eventually. Um, so those are the things to just kind of think about. Again, you could contact me, you could, uh, I gave you my work email. You can also um, Facebook uh, uh, contact me, Tony Only Mark Kovic on, on Facebook. You can also get to us through Synapse House. But um, I, I'm glad that Lisa did that presentation. That was great. I thought she was actually going to be here and we were going to have, she and I were going to talk and get things done and she didn't come. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah, she had to go out of town, unfortunately. But imagine if we, she spoke slowly how long that presentation would be. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Lisa, Lisa's fun. Yeah, she's, she's like trying to, you know. Capture something Thanks. that's very dynamic. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to say something, and I, I want to thank. Let's put our hands together for Mark for, for coming and, you know, helping us pioneer this exciting stuff. And, and Pete, thanks for talking for a minute. And thank you all for 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 being part of this, and uh, all the people here for the first time. Thank you for for wanting to check it out. And, and what uh, what Pete said about sharing is really really important. I think. And if I can, I, I didn't mention this, but if I could be of any assistance in you to figure out how to do this and how to motivate others, please feel free to contact me. That's why I gave you my card. If you have a story, you can tell me, but I'd rather you post it somewhere. Yeah, that was great. And he met, what you mentioned about the trust me die, that, uh, and, and we deal, you know, people like Anna with no arms and no legs, that's total trust, right? She's not doing anything on her own except breathing. You know, and, and we're equalizing for her. We're blocking her nose if that's what she needs, if she can't swallow. And uh, if, as long as she doesn't have pressure-related illnesses, she can go on a dive and have a blast. And what we're doing is we, as we bring adaptive diving to the next level, we've kind of touched on uh, the history and we've touched on how it's turned from a feel-good thing into a therapy and how it's really not about diving. It's about helping people with disabilities imagine the possibilities. But we're going to, you know, as the standards change, we'll be putting more pressure on buddies and on instructors. Um, as more and more people with really severe disabilities get in the water, they're not going to be able to do things for themselves. We're gonna be doing it. And that's why we've increased the, the hours in our class to 20 hours and um, in, in the just confined water so that we really, really task load buddies and give them confidence and skill sets that they wouldn't have they wouldn't have had otherwise and um, and I think Pete you talked a little bit about that and Dave and Julio and everybody in here that has gone through the buddy program knows that it I mean when you walk away from it are you not a better a better diver overall I see a lot of head nods so it's good to hear. so it's it's four o'clock I appreciate your guys being here and, and thanks for joining us for the for the fourth uh, adaptive scuba symposium that we've done uh, and thanks our, our world underwater and, and Midwest Tide News. And any other questions? Or all right, this will all be uh, eventually up on the, on the website, and you'll be able to share with others. And please check out other uh, uh, other uh, videos. Oh yeah, there's. Don't forget, Tina reminded me that the uh, 
we have a, a big it's fundraiser not free. battle of the band. Twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, unfortunately, you know, I don't draw a salary, and we have very, very few part-time people. But uh, we do have to raise funds to do what we do. So we appreciate any support. And stop by our booth and tell people to stop by our booth because we do do a lot of fun stuff going on. We have a split the pot, and then we're doing a trip giveaway as well. So all that stuff is going right on. To find out more about Dive Fest. Take a little walk there. No, it's big banner. <laughs> can run that on the scale. Yeah, thank, thank you all for being here. And what you said about stories is important, Pete. And, um, you know, I know that donors, a lot of times donors sometimes will be anonymous. And sometimes that's the way people participate with us as well. They'll want to come in and help and, and be low key and really not, you know, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm helping at the pool or the fundraiser or whatever. And I really don't want any, any attention or anything. But, yeah, but if you go out and tell your stories, like Pete was saying, I mean, each of us, you know, I mean, Dave's story with Mallory is, is moving. And, and, and I, have, I don't know that I've heard Julio tell a story where he hasn't cried. I mean, it's very, very <laughs> touching. <laughs> it's very touching. It's very touching. And all of us have different experiences. And what I see, yes, you know, doors. with a disabled diver, you know, I may see something that Ruth doesn't see. And, and, and Julio oh. may see something that, you know, Tina doesn't see or Sarah. So, well, this is you know, they all have a different take okay, on it, yeah. And, and you know what? No one can talk about who they're crying like us, because Coolio's not going to mention it. Yes, I am. But I think it's important for us to tell stories on each other as well for what we right. see because of the passion there. It's all embarrassing right. for us to talk about our passion, but it's very natural for us to talk about yeah. someone else's passion. Absolutely. Yeah. So stories stick. So go out and tell your stories, guys. Thank you very much. Hey, Jim, Write it down on school. On school. <laughs> yes. Please. Uh, it handles two tank dives, morning dives. Is those Are those the pleasure dives? And then the training takes place in the afternoon? Right. <laughs> yeah, we work in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All five days? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> He's laughing. Yeah, you're not worried about your drinking. I think you were boot camp, yeah. actually. Yeah, well, it's, time, it's done with luck. It's done with luck. <laughs> not and for that. The, I went on the yeah. entire yeah. trip yes. down there before, too, and it, it's, not just, it's not just the two tank dives. We went diving till all through the night and everything, too. Yeah, yeah. it's unlimited shore dives. Yeah. 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 And they yeah. got a great yeah. house for you yeah. right there at DV. Yeah, that's a beautiful house for you. It is, yeah. That's my favorite house in Cosmo. Where did Pete and Rick did? Yeah, what did you just say? <laughs> That's my favorite op in Cosmo. Call that Paradise? No, yeah, he's talking about Bonaire. Uh, yeah, 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 we have yeah, Flamingo. The, the Flamingo trip that he's got in his brochure. And what we'll do is we'll invite people from all over with all of all abilities. So just like that trip where I had five quadriplegics. Right. I mean, we don't know what we're going to have. And if you're going through training there, you will you may have an opportunity to do some real... <laughs> somebody and with some really high speed people but we're not going to put you in a situation that you can't handle I mean, we have primary buddies and we have secondary buddies and we have people that observe and it's all based on challenge by choice it's all a comfort level thing if, if you're uh, in Cozumel the last time we went Dave did we not have you know we have people that said you know I need to kind of work into this slowly this isn't you know I don't want to be handling anybody yet not all and that's cool are that's, that's good you shouldn't I'd rather have somebody tentative than somebody overconfident. Most of the stuff at Cozumel you did, I imagine, was in the short area. Uh, right off the pier. Yeah. Real close by. The boat diving, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, no, we were on walls and everything. Yeah, we were in Santa Rosa. Rosa. Santa Rosa. Yeah, they were really? doing really? swim throughs. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really... interesting, but... It's I, was, I was freaking, because I had a guy um, who... I said, when we go through the swim throughs, if I need, if I go like this, I need you to know I'm going to grab a hold of you because he could, he was a paraplegic, he could swim on his own, and, and in the open environment that was fine. Right. But, but when we're doing the swim through, through I'm going to come, yeah. I'm going to take your tank valve, I'm going to get on you, and we're going to do one of these tandem things. And he decided unilaterally that he was going to do it. He was going to do it on his own. So all of a sudden, I'm trying to keep him from hitting coral, and we're doing one of these. I mean, we're doing like this. So I'm like. You know, I'm contorting my body and, and right. trying to tweak things and, you know, it to... It can be very physical. Oh, I know. <laughs> we did the C-53, too, which was... Huh? We did the C-53. Yeah, the... the, the yeah, we, we, there's no... Yeah, there's a big yeah. flat area right out there yeah. by that. That's the wreck dive was really interesting because... The wreck dive, yeah. There was a lot of, there was a lot of current that day. 
you know, and none of us had been in the water yet, and it was on the wreck, and, and the dive master wanted us to jump here, and like parachuters drift into the wreck. He felt that was the way to go. That was your boat. <laughs> and I wasn't comfortable with that because I like people, you know, I know they're going to, if they go, you know, if, it's too, if it'll rip your mask off, we're not going. Right. But if, if they can go down, I know they'll get to the boat, where this might... Yeah, Some will, I know it'll happen. Oh, yeah. We'll have two teams over here and a team right. on the boat. And so yeah, it didn't, uh, so I, you know, I kind of bucked the dive master, and, and he's a pretty strong little guy, Victor. And, uh, oh, yeah, and, but we had a guy get in the water, and, I, and, I, and you know, one of the instructors, I said, well, what do you think? And he assessed it, and so we, we did it, and it turned out it wasn't anything near what, you know, the, cur the current at the surface is always stronger, so right. when we got down there, it was nothing. These people were swimming around the boat on their own, so it worked out. Anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy the show. We're booth 8... Um, 823, 825. 823, 824, and uh, I will see you guys there. 825. 825. 3.